Getting trashed with the web screen pictures A cheap night cause I'm feeling kinda thrifty Got a ten pack of beers and a bottle of whiskey Hop off the cork, have a glass of wine hey. That's what you'll say Trouble walking in a straight line But for the Apino Noir It's open bar With our host Mauler and the critical Hey, it's me Hello. and Mower. We're here. Yeah. How did this, how did this happen? <laughs> Stumbled into the bar once again. That's it. It's, it's, a, it's a Thursday night, and it's uh, it's time for another open bar. We're up to thirteen, lucky thirteen. So we'll see what happens. It's definitely yeah. not lucky for, for Mister H and his internet connection tonight, but we'll see. <laughs> we'll see okay. what happens. Yeah. Well, at least we've got two other guests with us this evening. We have got Andre from Midnight Sedge. Hey, man. Hey, greetings. Thanks for having me. How are things? Awesome, mate. We're just, uh, yeah, we're doing just fine here. And um, we've got a few we've got a few fairly interesting things to talk about tonight. And I think you'll be particularly great for giving us some insight into it. Yes, I uh, shall do my absolute best. I'm just going to pop open my, my Linja Akivit, the Norwegian vodka here, and... Uh, Get in the proper mood. Yes, nice one, man. Well, I've mm. got I've got my whiskey here. I've got Highland Park on the go, so all good. And uh, yeah, you were saying something about this vodka. Actually, it doesn't have to sail over the equator or something. Before, yeah, that's actually the, the cool thing about this particular one. It's called Linja Akivit or Aqua Vita, and the the Linja, the line in the name, refers to the equator. So this particular company, like part of their brand is that every single bottle, like every every liter that they sell of this particular vodka has been in a wooden barrel that has been in a boat and sailed across the equator before it's poured into bottles and sold in the stores. Nice. So, well, it's like a cool well brand traveled. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I like that, man. It's a nice, nice little uh, bit of lore to go with it. Well, yeah. our next guest, um, you know, he's famously not in favor of drinking. Um, famous, famous teetotaler on stream. It's Rakitsa Law. Hey, man. Hey, how's it going? <laughs> yeah, we're good, mate. <laughs> well, I've got my I've got my single malt uh, alkaline water to drink today <laughs> because because someone has to be a good Christian man amongst you drunkards. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, damn, that's that's why <laughs> whenever you you bring in Rakita, like he's he's rock solid on a stream because he never drinks, so it's right. you always know what you're getting. It's perfect. Right. I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna not be drinking this Glen Alaki, <laughs> uh, 18 year single malt uh, Speyside whiskey. So we nice. have our designated driver. <laughs> yeah, Moller, you you subsist on a diet of pure logic and and yeah. And uh, analytics, so you're you're all right. I think you'd be all right for driving. You know, you've got those like big tentacle arms as well. You can reach the wheel and all the controls, so you'd be fine. I have a spaceship, <laughs> probably. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> the law is hard to keep track of. Yeah, um, we we <laughs> we're also supposed to have Mr. H reviews on, um, and we we got like I don't know about ten seconds of fuzzy footage from him backstage before uh, <laughs> before he dropped out again. Uh, it looked like he was talking to us from the year 1997, um, judging by his webcam quality. But um, who knows? Hopefully, he'll get that sorry. I think there's there's some problems with his internet in his area. But yeah, fingers crossed he'll be able to come back. But hey, we, I guess we can carry on the show in the meantime. I think we can manage that between the four of us. I, do. I should think so. And uh, uh, the sooner Mr. H uh, joins us, the better. Yeah, nice one. Um, yeah, so I guess the the first thing that um, seems to be going on at the moment is that Amazon are slowly buying up uh, basically everything um, in the entertainment world, um, and they have just taken over MGM, which, by my understanding, gives them the rights to well, James Bond. Um, they've got Rocky now, the entire like Rocky franchise, um, and they own not just the back catalog, but I think the rights to a lot of these these franchises as well. So theoretically, they could start redoing them. Yay. Many of them, yes. It depends yeah, on the I, I can't franchise. wait for a remake of Rocky. Well, yeah. I, I'm just hoping for a gritty sequel a la Rambo 4, but Rocky, where he's punching guys and like knocking their heads off and ripping arms off and beating them to death. <laughs> Like Rocky goes to the streets of Philadelphia to clean it up. I think we could do this. I think this will be good. Do you guys see the newest Rambo? Uh, yes. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. That was I a strange one. 
I don't. <laughs> it was it was strange, but I don't care, man. There's some of those some of those kills when. Uh, oh, I appreciate the, the violence. Yeah, 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 I mean, when it gets to like the last <laughs> 20, 30 minutes, it, it gets right back into Rambo mode. It's just the rest of the movie leading up to that is a little bit weird and kind of weak. And yeah, yeah it's like a like meandering it. western. It's, it, it's yeah, it kind of was. Tight. As the one before it, I have to admit that. But still, I liked it, and I would love another one. Uh, I, I it honestly ended, certainly set the stage for one more. I mean, yeah, I mean, Stallone's like a like, hundred years old at this point, but yeah, he's still massive. He's still ripped. He could probably still do it. Um, I think Rambo Four, for me, it would have been fine to end it. Like I think yes, it was really action packed, nice and gory, um, plenty of great kills. There's a great epic battle scene at the end and it ends with him returning to the States and he goes back to his family home and it felt like a nice complete like character arc for him. Not exactly the most complex of storylines, but it's not really what you expect from a Rambo movie. It only goes to show that sometimes the simple is often the best. Uh, It doesn't have to be too advanced and if any movie shows that, it's that one. Yeah. I mean, I, I think so. I, this, I guess, that's the problem I had with the latest one, where it just, it felt like a th- generic thriller, which was fine. Like if it had just been a different thriller starring Stallone, um, it would have been okay. But it's like it had been retooled to turn it into a Rambo movie, so it was a little. Should have bit... made it Cobra too. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm t- man. I want over the top too. I want. I want to see him yes. arm wrestling again at like seventy five. <laughs> Maybe he can bankrupt another studio with uh, with Over the Top Part 2, because the first one nearly ended Canon Pictures back in the day. Really? No, it couldn't have had a budget. It had a massive budget, because they, they paid like Stallone $12 million for it. At the time, his rate was like $8 million, and they overpaid something ridiculous, just because they got all these credit lines and everything. And then the movie tanked completely. Not relative to what was spent on the actual production, but relative to what they paid Stallone. That's what killed the movie. And it- it's one of those ones that's a bit baffling, where you think, "How did they expect this to like be a mega hit? Like it's an arm wrestling contest movie." You know, it's like that one. Is it Rhinestone, where Stallone becomes like a country singer? And yeah. <laughs> A man with a severe speech impediment trying to be a country singer. <laughs> 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 it's-, <laughs> it's baffling. <laughs> Thing, though, with uh, with Canon Pictures, everything they did was baffling because they pumped out so many movies and there yeah. was no quality control, none well, whatsoever. It was, it, it was all fairly low budget, wasn't it? It was all kind of scraped together. And Actually, when it was low budget, they did fairly okay. Because here's the thing, before they, before they moved to America and became Canon Pictures, the two guys behind it, uh, Menachem um, Gudan and Yuram Globus, they were the kings of the Israeli industry. They were oh, Israeli Hollywood. Yeah, that's them. They were the ones that became canon. And then they became to America, came to America, they started up canon. And to begin with, it went really, really good. They continued doing what they did before. They pumped out movies on a budget, but then they got ambitious. Then the budgets became higher. And at one point there, Menachem Gulan, who was like the the creative guy, not the money guy, that was Globus, but the but the creative guy, he went completely nuts and he started spending money much faster than Globus could bring it in. And he like wildly overspent their credit lines, everything, because at one point the money just became a number to him. So he was like, oh, so Stallone wants eight million, I'll give him twelve million. Damn. Yeah. Cocaine's the hell of a drug. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, I remember yeah. Golem Globus like that because that was their original, um, you know, moniker, wasn't it? Like they they produced films yeah. under just that title, and then they moved over to Canon. Yeah, they acquired. Yeah, Canon. they did a bunch that of the Norris like, movies, right? Yeah, like the uh, the Missing in Action and some America yeah. stuff like that. Delta he was Force, one of their stable stars. Uh, same with like Michael Dudikoff, who did American Ninja. He was like one of their guys. Jean Claude Van Damme became one towards the end of uh, of their run with Cyborg, which started out as Masters of the Universe Part Two, or at least the, the scrappy remains of it. But that actually was a good, was a big success. I one like Cyborg. That's ones. a good flick. Uh, people are mentioning Demolition Man. I would love to see a Demolition Man too, yeah. um, because we're essentially living in the world of Demolition Man now. So, like, where can it you take it? It's horrible. 
Oh, yeah, kind of. That, here's like the thing: you have like this this guy in the future, right? Like this guy who's like a big, fat, sexually ambiguous, and pretty useless. That's kind of like everyone now, isn't it? Wait, you talking about Demolition Man? Yeah, and Demolition Man. This is like one of the uh, one of the aides of the villain. Uh, oh, like associate this... Bob. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, he's great. Yeah, I love he, how he is his, great, his, but, uh... his, his boss gets killed, and he just like straight away aligns himself with Wesley Snipes. <laughs> like, guy does how not fuck around. How many people are like that today? Yeah, like not really like standing for anything. I I, I think just like. That whole world where you can get fined for swearing in public, or um, you know, everyone's just kind of a, a, a feminized pussy because, like, they, they've never encountered any kind of like violence or hardship or anything. It's all been bred out of them. Like, damn! Like anyone living in California now could probably identify with that. I'm sure. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah, I yeah. I doubt they'd do it though, right? Like, they wouldn't do that movie. The movie no. would be, uh, the movie now would be controlled like. Uh, some white corporate uh, evil mastermind lording over the world after after a business takes over control of everything. It would basically be rollerball, but like less honest. <laughs> <laughs> you, you basically need another Gulam and Globus to make that movie today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, they didn't no have one... anything to do with the original, but like someone like that who just doesn't care. Yeah, Someone they, mentioned they, Tango and Cash as well. I would fucking love to see a Tango and Cash too. Um, yeah, just yeah. If they like, brought Stallone and uh, and uh, Kurt Russell back together for it. That would be hilarious. The guy would be great. <laughs> like that. Like they're in retirement or whatever, and something happens. They got to come yeah, back. Yeah, there's and like kill there's John a, Voight. Yeah, there's like a, a plot to like um, buy up their retirement community that they're living in or something, and they've got to like <laughs> bust the the criminal. Like you know, scumbag real estate agent who's going to broker the deal or something. Uh, that's so funny. <laughs> yeah, Tango and Cash was great fun. Um, yeah, I'm planning to review that at some point. It's just one of those like dumb, um, disposable, fun buddy cop movies that was just all the rage in the eighties. Yeah, back when you were allowed to have fun. Back when you yeah, were allowed yeah, to I remember make, that. Uh... Time. I remember it right. vaguely. <laughs> you could you could make a movie like a, a Golan Globus uh, production. You could just put together a movie. It didn't have to be a seven hundred million dollar budget. You could get it into theaters and people could just buy the shit out of it because they just sat down there like, you know what? I like this. This is OK. There's machine guns. There's there's giant tractors crushing stuff. There's a there's a minivan with like guns all over it. I'm good. I'm in. This is this is what I want in my life. Now you can't have that. No, it's uh, yeah, it's too violent and it's too toxic. Um, well, the it's minivan needs a backstory now. Yeah, <laughs> I uh, yeah, I was doing a, I was doing a like an interview with a director um, a couple of nights ago over here, and um, he had directed the latest Hellboy movie, and I was asking him like because you know I, I knew it hadn't been well received, and I was asking him how that was like as as director, what was experience like. And um, I expected a kind of diplomatic answer, like, you know, it was, it was interesting, but it's a shame it didn't quite turn out as well as we'd hoped, but it was great fun. <laughs> he just straight up said, that was fucking shit, man. <laughs> it was like one of the worst scripts I've ever seen. And the, the biggest problem was that um, the, the studio was just all over it. Like, he, he'd be walking actors through scenes, and there would be, like producer guys from the studio there um, countermanded him and say, no, we, we think you should do it this way instead. And just telling the actor directly, no, do what I say Damn. instead. And he said, I didn't even have control of the movie I was directing. And it makes me think this is what must happen all the fucking time with so many of these big budget films, because there's so much money at stake. They're not even willing to take a chance on letting the director like fulfill their vision for the film. They have to like have, their own suits there just controlling everything um I, I absolutely believe that's what happens with every marvel movie that's that gets made you know you bring in these like oscar winning directors like chloe zhao it's like she's not fucking directing that she's just a, a figurehead for it they have yeah. Yeah. everything in marketing uh yeah actually they've actually said exactly how that goes on uh yeah they don't have to direct the action or anything like that no they have their own people that does that that actually 
does all the stuff of doing the uh, doing the real direction the first ad does that the only times when a director like chloe zhao is needed is for the very particular things that they were hired for and that is typically stuff like character interactions that's what the director is there for just make sure that we get this kind of chemistry between the actors and that we get this kind of scene and this emotional resonance that's what the directors are there for because they always hire these relative newcomers that can be <clears throat> expected to manage these massive, massive productions. But yeah, that's like a really good, honest uh, take from uh, from the director of the Hellboy remake. I have to ask him, did he say anything about um, when he directed episodes of the Constantine TV series? Uh, no, we didn't. We, we, you know, we didn't touch on that. Um, we talked about Black Sails and Game of Thrones that he directed. Um, but yeah, I never really got onto Constantine. I'm afraid. I just love. Is Black Sails any good? People seem to like it. Yeah, I, I don't know yeah, much yeah. about it. Like, I know it's got pirates in it, and that's that's enough for me. <laughs> um, uh, from what I've seen, it's amazing. I've I haven't seen all of it. I've seen like a couple of episodes, but it's uh, it's um, like Rome and Vikings only with pirates and Long John Silver, whatever his name is. Well, I'm sold. He, he said that they there was a like they'd put a huge amount of money into like the production of it. Like the 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 big ship that they use is mounted on this like giant gimbal thing to make it rock from side to side. Um, but it it had like a weight limit, so you could only have like fifty or so people on the ship at the time. But then the crew is like almost fifty people as it stands, and so they realized they just couldn't fucking use it. So like all of that which cost millions of dollars to build was just fucking useless for them. Um, <laughs> but I guess that's just what happens with these productions, you know? Actually, that is exactly what happens. Like, for instance, <clears throat> in uh, in Superman Returns, you know, that 2006 masterpiece, Superman from Brian Singer, the one that everyone has forgotten and no one cares about. I mean, shit, man, I would take it now compared to most of the movies we get. <laughs> yeah, I don't disagree with, uh, with, with that, though, but... Um, but the single most expensive sequence in that movie cost like ten million dollars or something. This one sequence of Superman going back to where Krypton used to be, and uh, with flashbacks and explosions and what have you, not and Singer decided, ah, don't work. After it's completely done and ten million dollars wasted, just cut it. Yeah, <laughs> this, this and, is what must. Um, this this must be really. I don't know, just heartbreaking for a director because, like, they're always going to be under pressure to get the movie as short as possible, you know, for runtime reasons. Yeah. Um, and to have spent that much time and that much effort, um, you know, constructing entire scenes, filming it, editing it, and then just to to discover, nah, this has to be cut. It's just gonna, no one's ever gonna see it. Like that is so shit. You, uh, you bring that up with the Joker <laughs> scene being released for Batman, like. Was it yesterday? Yeah, it was something like that. You can barely tell what anyone's saying, though. But... Uh, yeah, I, I only just recently watched it, and it was like, you know, a lot of people are discussing, should it have been cut, should it have been cut? And it's like, I don't know, I guess uh, he had to. He probably had a lot of stuff he didn't want to cut. He had, he had a much longer cut of uh, the Batman before we ended up with a three-hour one, I think. So Yeah, and you probably had a lot of stuff that could have been cut in the three-hour one, too, to be honest. But, uh... You have half a movie that could be cut from a three-hour movie <clears throat> every time. <laughs> There's, um, yeah, I mean, the, if you cut all the slow motion sequences of him just walking into like crime scenes and stuff, you could probably save about twenty or thirty minutes just doing that. I think, uh, <laughs> didn't didn't Paul Feig famously say there's like a there's like a ten hour version of content of Ghostbusters 2016? So we've all got a. I think it was like a four hour cut of it. I, I oh. thought he said like the largest version. They had like loads of really great improv comedy to get in there. <laughs> yeah, I kind of question that because if, uh, if he also said that all the best improv was in the final movie, and I didn't even smile once, and 10 hours of things that didn't make the cut, I mean, I don't even want to think about that. It was just yeah. painful to watch that. Like, people who, you know, knew that they didn't have any anything to work with and were just desperately trying to come up with gags on the fly. Like, how did you ever think that was going to work? Speaking of how yeah, we're putting these four movie. daring, brilliant female comedians in one place, the comedy yeah. is just gonna keep coming. We don't even need a script. What are you talking about? 
<laughs> yeah. the, the worst thing there, though, uh, and this is uh, apparently there was one scene where where uh, Paul Feig, in a most manly way, he broke down on set and started crying. And that was when <laughs> well, that was when filming like this epic dance sequence because they made such a big deal out of it in the script, and they I heard even about hyped it up particularly when they pitched the movie in the first place. And then the time came to film it, and it just didn't work. They tried over and over, but it was just a bunch of crap, but it didn't work. So oh, Paul misery. Feig, he, he broke down, and he had a good cry on set, and then they carried on, and they just tried to sell it as well as they could. Uh, it is in the extended version of the movie. But again, this was like an expensive scene with loads of extras and everything like that, right? Uh, and in the theatrical version... They just like remixed it into the end credits. Wasn't good was, enough to be yeah, put into the movie I, itself. I was gonna say, like, how how good could it be that you would you would really want to watch a dance sequence going for several minutes? Like that mm. that's I mean, that's just Paul Feig's mindset. It's like, yeah, dancing, of course that's fucking fun. Like everyone enjoys dancing, don't they? <laughs> no, Paul, we don't. <laughs> no. Spider-Man 3 would like to know your location. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I'll tell you, there's, there's the, the one bit that does make me chuckle, uh, not in Ghostbusters, but like when it comes to dancing, um, it's in Peacemaker. Um, the, the intro has got him just, and, and all the cast doing the most goofy fucking dancing yeah. imaginable. But somehow it just kind of works. Like, a great Norwegian song uh, in the in the opening track. That's a Norwegian band. I just have to go oh, to really? Norwegian. Yeah. Wigwam. Right, okay. Neat. Uh, no, that's pretty cool. Pretty cool. Um, I'm only a couple of episodes into Peacemaker so far, um, but I'm quite liking it. I, I love it's, Peacemaker. Uh, it's, funny. it's like it's my favorite. I, I know opinions are divided on it, but I have to say, like of all the series I've seen in the last few years, which honestly aren't that many, Peacemaker may be one of my favorite ones. I just unabashedly love Peacemaker. That's don't really Cena love one? John Cena, but uh, but I yeah. do love Peacemaker. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's uh, yeah, it's good. It, you know, the the plot is bonkers, but I I feel like the plot is almost like irrelevant to this. It's just like getting from moment to moment and kind of gag to gag, um, and just him dicking around. It's like, um, yeah, it's it's pretty funny. Like watching him fight like a, a crazy alien possessed woman in his underpants. It's, just, <laughs> it's great stuff. <laughs> it, it is. Yeah. Uh, the, uh, rolling there. I finished Reacher not too long ago. Speaking of Amazon and series, uh, I finished Reacher the other day, and I thoroughly enjoyed it uh, quite a bit. Quite a bit. I don't know if you guys have watched it at all. I, I'm only a couple episodes in with that as well, um, but I've been really liking it so far. Um, yeah, like I, I feel like you just wouldn't get a character like Reacher. If he was written today, like this is based on a series of books that started way back in the nineties. Yeah. And it's got that real feel to it. Like he's a proper well, he's an alpha male, for lack of a better description. You know, he'll answer you when he's good and fucking ready. Like he walks everywhere, <laughs> like he doesn't hurry to anything. Um, and when it's time to do violence, he absolutely does it without hesitation. Um he's he's yeah, he's a pretty cool character, and I think they got a good actor to play him. Yeah, I, I am still uh, I'm I'm still fond of his other show a little I think a little bit more uh, Blue Mountain State, which is um, one of my favorite comedy series of all time where he plays Thad Castle, but uh, but I I enjoyed Reacher quite a bit. It's exactly what you just said. I mean he is uh, he is the quiet deadly male stereotype. He's analytical. He's smart. He's not attached to possessions or anything or anyone. Which, I mean, you could see is broken unless you need to be that type of character, right? Unless you need to be detached uh, to, to solve the crime. You need to be the outsider. So he's a, a quintessential Western hero coming into a town uh, overrun by corruption. And he's going to solve the problem just incidentally, like to his, uh, to his uh, situation. You just happen to be there. It's, it's yeah. great. I love and, it. And um, yeah, like he... Uh he's got this wealth of, of experience, but also like his ability to notice just the tiniest details um, is what sets him apart, I suppose, from just your average detective or whatever. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I have not seen it, but perhaps 
one day with enough people recommending it. Um, it's also on top of Amazon right now, right? Kind of. Yeah. It, it was. It was their top rated program for a while, for sure. Um, it's the one that got away from their quality control. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. For it's it's people, not really. Cons- it's, it's the one that slipped through the fingers. They were it so busy with Lord of the been... Rings and Wheel of Time that that one just slipped through the cracks. Oh, yeah, I didn't. I didn't detect the message in it. That's for sure. Maybe Most people at me to to push back, quote unquote, on Peacemaker. I thought it was shit, but I only watched an episode and a half, so there's not much I can. Drink is already more of an expert on it than I am now. <laughs> so... Yeah, and that's not by much. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, I, I yeah. was not watching it in terms of like analyzing the plot or anything. I was just like, ah, it's funny because I didn't dumb. find it funny. That was my one of my primary issues. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, did you find the joke funny, for example, where he's like eagerly is presented right on its own, of which I think Freeman watched it had like a giggle out of that. And I was like, yeah, yeah, that works. And then they like front and center that joke. And then the other characters point out, wow, that's really dumb. Why would you have an eagle called Eagly? That's like yeah, that's not a that's daughter not called Daughtery. I was like, holy I shit! I have to say that yeah, e- Eagly to me is the single weakest part of the entire show. Uh, that's that I, I... to me that was a failure. But beyond that, that's I mean the really cool character is um, is uh, is his sidekick that comes in uh, in later episodes. The one who's a complete psychopath. Um, he's. Uh, he he really steals the show later on, and the interaction between the two is freaking fantastic. So that's something that uh, I know that you'll enjoy, Drinker. And Mahler, yeah. I think you'd have enjoyed it too if you had gotten that far. The thing that put me off mainly was because I, I felt like the Peacemaker in the show wasn't quite the same as the Peacemaker from the movie. I really liked the Peacemaker in the movie. He seemed a little more focused and... Um, Despite that, what's funny about him comes from his lack of understanding of how absurd a lot of the things he's saying is in the context he's in. But in this show, really felt like a lot of the jokes are coming at his expense, which I wasn't enjoying. Like, what a fool doing this, what a fool doing that. While I took him quite seriously in the, the Suicide Squad, I really. It's going to come back I, in later episodes because um, there it is, just that. It's like him. him making making comments, not really having a clue. So. It's a little bit of what you're saying, and uh, but it does re- revert a little bit, at least, to uh, to to the kind of humor that was with him in the Suicide Squad, which incidentally was my favorite movie of last year. Yeah. Oh, um, what I would say though is uh, I probably wouldn't disagree at all with the fact that it's better than all the Marvel shows they put out of the ones I've seen. <laughs> I, I think not to, a very yeah, high bar. Not a very to, high bar. Still. Yeah. To to reference like the, you know your critique of like the humor in it i think it's like the nature of something like this when there's so many jokes thrown at you inevitably a lot of them are not going to land that well like for me enough of them did land to get a chuckle out of me that i was amused by the show and i was kind of enjoying it um and yeah like i i kind of get what you're saying about how because he's not on mission now and he doesn't have like a, a specific objective as such he's got to find things out for himself he's not as focused and he's not as um he doesn't seem initially as much of a threat as he did because he's not an antagonist now. Um, and that's obviously just the, the nature of making him the protagonist. He's got to go through a bit of a journey now and not always be um, privy to everything. But he, he has enough moments where he's switched on enough to notice things and, um, and you know, banter back with people and, and hit them with, with insults and stuff that he can kind of hold his own. Mm-hmm. Generally. Yeah, I would say, like, maybe give it a, a couple more episodes well, and see you how you can, feel with it. If you finish it up, and then tell me it's worth it. All right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm your fucking recon. I'll just go out there and take the bullets for you, man. <laughs> hey, you were for Arcane, and that worked out great, so I'm going to hire you yeah, from yeah. now on to test I'll, shit for me. Yeah, I'll no, you're the food tester. Food. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, Drinker will get sent in to decide if it's worthy of Mauler's time. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll find something for you someday. What was that film I told you to watch the other day? Oh yeah, Whiplash. Whiplash. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, that's on. That's uh, been at the back of my mind, along mm. with porn and uh, violence. But yeah, it's there. That's a great um, movie. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah Whiplash, got... the drumming movie. Yeah. Yeah. God, I haven't seen that. It looks good. It it's is got amazing. J.K. Simmons, isn't it? Hasn't it? Yeah. yeah. One of his uh, best really roles. Mm-hmm. If and not that is the high bar. Also. So, no, I do like him. I've got a lot of time for him as an actor, so um, 
I'll be interested to watch this one. Um, but yeah, going back just for a second, um, when we were talking about Amazon buying over MGM, they're also buying over the rights to The Hobbit. And this is, this is where it gets a little bit confusing, right? Because apparently they have now secured the movie rights to The Hobbit. So does that mean that they could decide to remake The Hobbit trilogy if they wanted or just make a, a whole new movie or TV show about The Hobbit? There are two sides to that. Two sides to that. Uh, one is what they already have acquired, right? And that is um, with uh, in acquiring MGM. Then they got a ton of other things that we've talked about. They got Robocop, they got parts of Rocky, not the full franchise, but parts of it. Uh, they got the Pink Panther, which I'm particularly upset about. Mm. And they got a big stake in the Hobbit movies by Peter Jackson. Uh, because uh, MGM was part of uh, of making those movies. They were like co-financier and co-production company. So there's that level to it. So that means that uh, that they own um, uh, they own the um, um, the rights to the catalog movies. Or they don't actually own them yet, because here's the thing, the the acquisition has been announced, but it hasn't gone through yet. It has to go through all of these branches of government. It has to go through, get FD, FDC approval and everything like that. So on paper, it could still be blocked. But in principle, if everything goes through, then they would own the rights to Peter Jackson's catalog movies. Now, that's one as aspect to it. This doesn't automatically mean that they can remake those movies and make another Hobbit adaptation. The rights for those are with the Soul Sands Company. The Soul Sands Company, they own the movie and entertainment rights to The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, and I think Silmarillion, but I'm not entirely sure about that. Now, this is where it gets uh, gets interesting, because the Soul Sands Company, they are in the market to sell off the movie and the entertainment rights to both The Hobbit and to Lord of the Rings. This is something that they announced in Variety back on February 9th, something thereabouts that they were selling. We're hoping to get two million of it. Uh, they were in talks with an investment bank that was going to broker the deal for them. Uh, and um, uh, and then this investment bank is then reaching out to potential buyers who might be interested in picking up the entertainment and movie rights altogether. Now, one company on their shortlist is, of course, <laughs> Amazon. And we've gotten like some 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 word that a deal already has happened, but I haven't seen this listed in the trades. So maybe some signatures still need to be signed. Maybe Warner is an issue here, because when the Soul Sands company announced that they were interested in selling this, and Riketa, this is something that you will find interesting. What they said in the announcement was that they're now selling these rights because they are of the opinion that Warner's rights have expired and reverted to them because they haven't made a Lord of the Rings movie for a very long time. Mm. But maybe unbeknownst to them, Warner is actually making the animated feature The War of Rohirrim or something like that. And the reason it's... Uh, and why it would be animated is obviously because it's a rights retainer and Warner has lawyers that know how to read fine print and the Soul Sands company evidently doesn't have that because they've been in so much legislation which is ultimately down to them not being able to read their own contracts how did so, how the fuck did they acquire these rights in the first place like well, they've had uh, them since the 70s or something yeah, haven't they yeah, yeah they have uh, because uh, the uh, the uh, Tolkien estate uh, needed money, so they first sold them off to they first sold them off to a movie studio. I can't remember which one, and then that movie studio in turn sold them to the Soul Sands Company, and then they've stayed there for ever since. Okay, so uh, so Warner acquires the rights on a limited basis. Uh, yeah, they get the license, the same kind yeah. of license that, for instance, Paramount would have to make a Marvel movie. Right, or or that Sony had to make Spider-Man. Exactly. Uh, 
Exactly. And and so the way these work out is you have to make you have to make use of the uh, license every X amount of years, otherwise you lose it. And so the you're saying the idea is that Warner has not exercised its license rights, so this company is now selling. That's the what they are rights. saying. They, they even yeah. say in the announcement, "We are of the opinion that they Oof. haven't exercised their rights, and therefore the rights are forfeit, and we can sell off the um, the Lord of the Rings rights." Buyer beware uh, on that one. Yeah, that, that seems like yeah, that seems like a pretty shaky basis to do a, a multi-million dollar deal like this. Like, oh, we're of the opinion that we can do this. So yeah, yeah sure, let's go ahead with it. Well, that's what I was thinking yeah. too. Uh, but but that is for Lord of the Rings, which is a separate um, separate license than the Hobbit. Uh, so what we have heard then is that with the Lord of the Rings, Warner. They have the license. That's an obstacle. Those rights aren't going anywhere unless Amazon feels like just picking up everything rock stock and uh, owning the rights and having Warner pay the licensing fee to them instead of the Salt Sands Company while Warner keeps on making Lord of the R a competing Lord of the Rings product to their own. Not the best of deal. But apparently, they're all over those Hobbit rights because mm -hmm. that's closer to the rings of power anyway. So this hasn't been officially announced, but from what we understand, it's pretty close to happening, if it hasn't even happened already. But, um, and if that is true, if Amazon has reached some kind of deal with the Soul Sands company for the Hobbit rights, if that is accurate, then that means that Amazon, they can do whatever the hell, pardon my French, they want. Then, because then they would have all the rights. They would be able to make theme parks, they can make video games, they can make movies, they can make TV series, and they can make them exactly <laughs> however they want. There is no quality control whatsoever beyond what they choose to institute themselves. Because the time when the Tolkien estate actually had some level of quality control, that was uh, when Christopher Tolkien was alive, that time's over. The current owners, they don't care the same way, as evident by the Rings of Power. And, uh, yeah, of course, Amazon, they will want some Tolkien scholars there, just so that they can say that this is approved by scholars. But the actually good scholars, like Tom Shippey, they got rid of. And they replaced him with a bunch of, well, technically they may be scholars, but they're activists first and foremost, who probably hate Tolkien. Uh, but uh, but they took, took some courses and can call themselves a Tolkien scholar, although they hate everything he did. Well, the best news is uh, I heard that um, seven, seven Hobbit actors were recently just freed from their contracts by Peter Dinklage. So uh, we should have we should have an ample cast for the upcoming Hobbit movie from Amazon. <laughs> Which is what, that's what everyone would expect, I guess. They'll try and use the Hobbit in some way, shape, or form as best they can and desperately cling at trying to get to the rest of the rights they want. Do you think a lot of this is going to depend on ultimately the success of rings of power like if this is a massive smash hit then they will go all out to snap up as many rights as they can um you know money be damned because ultimately it'll be so, worth yeah. it whereas if it was a complete flop and everyone hated it then they would probably just pull back from it and say that nah, it's not worth the expenditure to try and get so the the rest of these these um franchises or the so rights to do be a more plan, right this rings a power shit. It's five yeah, it's, five uh, it's already committed to, to for five That's seasons, insane. which means that we're getting five seasons no matter what. So everyone imagine who having hates... that much money. Imagine right. being no able to what. spend hundreds like, of millions on on this but that's happened it's... before other than only not for five seasons but like for instance the deal uh between uh, secret hideout and uh, and uh, netflix for the international rights for for star trek discovery three seasons it was getting three seasons no matter what even if there were zero viewers and you saw that the moment that uh, the three seasons were were up netflix got the hell out of it same thing with uh, with picard and amazon that was also sold for three seasons in advance 
And Amazon were like, fine, we haven't, we can't get out of this. So we're filming seasons two and three in one production cycle. So it's really an extended season two, but they're making it like seasons two and three. So season three of Picard is already in the can. Uh, and same thing here. This was uh, for for a five season deal for the Rings of Power. It doesn't matter if it has zero viewers. So anyone thinking it's going to get cancelled early, let me disabuse you of that notion. It's getting five seasons no matter what. And here's the thing, though. Uh, what I think is that they are so all in on this right now. They're not going to wait too many years. Now is when the Hobbit rights are for sale. They're all over them. So if they get like this deal, why would they stop? They can afford it. Even if it has zero viewers, uh, Amazon can just write off that money in a heartbeat. You don't think about it because it's made up literally everything else that they earn. They can afford mm. to be activists with The Hobbit just for the message. And they well, this, is, this is what's really worrying me, right? Because going kind of circling back to what I was saying there about them buying up MGM, like they have essentially unlimited funds at this point, Pretty much. all the resources they could ever need, yeah. even if things fail and they lose money on certain things doesn't matter in the long run, doesn't matter they're, in they're the really... slightest, doesn't even matter in the short run <laughs> and so look look what it's doing though, because they bought up MGM, I'm sure other studios will, will follow suit and get bought up by Amazon or Disney, and Damn, at what point does it just become a monopoly? At what point does, I don't know, legislation step in and say, no, this is becoming um, like anti, anti-competitive. anti If you essentially own every studio, th there's nothing to compete against. You, you control the entire entertainment industry. You know, that can't be allowed, surely. Well, as long as, you know, I mean, it, it's easy to argue that Amazon owns too much until you consider how big Netflix is. I think and Disney and and Disney, yeah, and so Apple, uh, Apple can buy many more companies before that becomes an issue. So it's like there, there's, there, there. It, it almost feels to me like the studios aren't uh, being. It's not a new thing that's happening. They're just reshuffling the owner ownership structure that was already there, because uh, you already had uh, these studios owned largely by five to ten companies that had like every uh, major to semi-major movie studio kind of under their wings. So now it's just shifting to tech companies that own those parent companies and a little bit of restructuring between what brands are under which umbrellas is what it looks like to me. But uh, I could be wrong. I'm, I'm curious if you guys think that the Amazon uh, Lord of the Rings will be, now, regardless of the quality of the show, if it will actually be a financial failure though. I, I think it's so hard to gauge because, like we've discussed, it doesn't bring in revenue by itself. It's going to be about right. selling Amazon Prime subscriptions. Exactly. Yeah. This is the same with, like, really all of the streaming sir, uh, streaming uh, series and movies and what have you. Not. It's very difficult. Uh, difficult to gauge the profitability profit sorry profitability of each individual uh, production because they're all part of the overall offering for consumers and that's what right. ultimately matters it's like the whole package and uh, some parts of the package may be less appealing other parts may be more appealing the most important thing is that the package as a whole keeps on growing and delivering value and in the case of Amazon, they have that sorted. They're like the one that doesn't have to worry about it, especially in conjunction with the rest of their business. Well, they, I this think is it. That, when, you've uh, got, when you've got yeah. Prime, you know, you, you've not only got access to all their shows and movies and stuff, but then you've also got access to like just the Prime benefits if you're using Amazon. Exactly. So like, it's yeah. a dual offering, which yeah. like something like you know, Disney Plus doesn't necessarily have. And um, what Netflix that means have. is that they can easily write off any kind of losses that um, that uh, the rings of power is going to give them. And I think it's going to. I don't think that the money that they're spending on that, they will ever get back in isolation. But they can argue that it's a vital part of the overall content offering. And that gives them so many other business in all the other areas that is worth it in the end anyway. 
although no one can really say that because those numbers are a closely guarded secret that yeah. no Amazon will ever know. So we'll have this, to take this the is, word for it. Yeah, this is kind of what pisses me off, is that it used to be when a film hit the cinemas, you could tell what its box office was, and you would know if right. it was a success. With something like this, which has got the budget of a major like AAA movie, you, yeah. you've got no clue if it's going to be successful or not. You've got no idea how many people are watching it, what kind of revenue it's brought in. Uh, it's all, like you say, Andre, behind closed doors. And so they could just straight up lie if they wanted to and pretend it's been a massive hit. We wouldn't fucking know any better. Or well, it's going to go straight also... into the top show on Amazon every yeah. every episode, right? Like, there's yeah. no way that they don't put that in the trending tab. They'll push it every, every yeah. time. And, yeah. you know, it, it, I don't know how much the Lord of the Rings name will be able to carry it. Maybe there is a lot of potential there. Maybe a lot of normal people will just be like, oh, this is the Lord of the Rings thing? Cool. Or or it won't, because enough word of mouth will spread so. around and people hate it. Like, who knows how it'll go exactly uh, no i i think the hatred is like it's definitely there but it's amongst the hardcore fandom yeah. um which I mean, is trailer, fair right? enough I got but, like, annihilated oh yeah yeah like it was um it was ratioed properly like certainly in the uk i think the us got to that point as well which um to compare <coughs> uh the new game of thrones show like that wasn't ratioed it wasn't even close and all the comments were really positive about um uh, house of the dragon fucking... Yeah, uh, House of the Dragon, like people are like, yeah, it's gonna be great. So it's like, you know, as much as there was fans of, of, of that that are like still bitter about what they did, it's just like maybe they've gotten over it faster than Tolkien fans are to willing to see a butchering of their their favorite story of all time sort of shit. Like, I don't know. Uh, well, I don't know what to expect with this. I don't think that uh, those fans excited for the House of the Dragon maybe are representative for the majority of the audience, though. I, I think um, probably like actual um, fans of, of George R. R. Martin, um, they must be infuriated by shows like House of the Dragon. Because all so. of that stuff is just like another drain on his attention, and it's another thing that he's doing to avoid writing Winds of Winter. <laughs> And <laughs> write the fucking book, George. Write the book, That's George. It. Like, man, it, it's like uh, I watched Gary's video about this just recently, and like he made like a blog update on it, and it was so fucking salty. Like, not not Gary's video, but like George's update saying, like, yeah, yeah. I know Winds of Winter is important to you, but you know what? All these other things are important to me too. Uh, and he's just like going on about all the other like irrelevant There's... fucking vanity projects that he's working on that uh, are taking up all of his time. Let's give Kathy Bates a sledgehammer and put her to work. <laughs> <laughs> Write the book, George. Right the <laughs> That's book. it. I mean, man, he just need he needs to be like severed from from the internet, and he needs to be removed from from doing all these produ like producer gigs. And just told, right, fucking forget all that. Forget about all the conventions and attending the opening of every fucking letter. Just sit in front of your, your fucking DOS computer and fucking finish this book. That's all you have to do before you die. I mean, Because I think... you're, you're really old and you're really fat and you're really unhealthy <laughs> and you you might not be around that much longer. It's true. <laughs> um, but I, I think that that post was especially annoying because this is stuff that George Arbaugh's fans have known for like a decade. We knew this was the case. We were just waiting for you to admit it. Like, we knew you'd, you'd lost interest. We knew you got other stuff you want to work on. May as well have just been honest about it from the get-go and then fucking try to figure out the, the solution to that problem instead of leading people on for ages being like, oh, no, it will be ready by this year. No, no next year. No, no, the next year. Oh, with COVID happening, I'm locking myself up in my cabin. And I'll be working nonstop on it. And it's just like, I don't believe you. Yeah. And then he comes yeah. out with one that's really just like, you know, frustrated with everybody. Just like, oh, I should be able to work on what I want to work on. It's like, you know what? You can. You are free to do that. You could have just told us this a decade ago. That's all you had to do. Yeah, what he, you have he, to do was, uh, that, that was... Yes, carry on, sorry. Yeah, that, that dude's biggest fucking problem in his career is that he can't say no to anything. It's like, we're, we're making like five prequel shows of Game of Thrones. Uh, do you want to be a producer on it and, and be deeply involved in the right end and stuff? Yeah, sure. You know, hey, could you do like a, 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 a you know, a companion book for like the world of um, Westeros? Yeah, sure, I can do that. You know, can you do like a Duncan Egg fucking five volume set of like their prequel story? Yeah, okay, I can do that. 
It's like at a certain point, you just have to say, no, I'm, I've got to do Winds of Winter. Sorry, like this is more important. I need to get this finished. I'll get, I'll get back to you later. Say, he's figured out how to say no to his own fucking work. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know why I, I tell you, man, it? like, no, on, on you go, Andre. I've interrupted you enough. Oh, that's all right. I think he does it because he doesn't know how to end it. I think that he is so lost in his own story because he's like this kind of writer that just comes up with the characters and then they dictate the story, which is why it's really compelling and good for a while there. But at some point, I think he lost track of the story. I think the reason he's only finished like maybe half of like the the next book and hasn't even started on the one after that is because he doesn't know where it's going he doesn't know how to end this but if someone offers hey prequel this prequel that he can do that because he sees where it kind of has to end up and then it's much easier to like come up spitball 10 ideas right away and and he knows how to do that that's something that he can get done on time and get paid for it Whereas alternatively, he can sit and he can work on uh, the winds of winter, and he can sit there during COVID. You know that scene in The Shining, when yeah. when the wife of Jack Nicholson comes to him and sees what he's been actually writing on the whole time, <laughs> and it's like pages and pages and pages and pages of him like writing like all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. I would not be surprised if the half of the winds of winter that he has written is something along that, that he just, he's burned out creatively. He doesn't know where to take the story. And that's why he's just shunning it. He's not working on it. And he works on the stuff that he can work on, that he knows what to do with the prequel now, I've got a, I've got a different theory. What he's going to do is let everyone else finish the series and bomb the ending. And then he's going to watch and he's going to pick the ending that's that's better after it. He's going to be like, okay, so the, the TV show ended it this way. There's fan fiction out there. They ended it this way. This is all just garbage and everyone hates it. Now I'll end it the right way. That's that's the plan I would do if I was well, I, I He's never going to end this. Like, there is a if, if he gets Winds of Winter done, I'll be impressed. But, you know, okay, you it's probably that, yeah. doable. But what do you but think like, he wants? Like, I, that's my theory, like, why he hasn't done it. But, but why, as a writer yourself, and if you have this ma massive work, why wouldn't you finish it when you know this is your legacy? Why do all these other I, I think he, I, I think he probably wants to finish it. I just don't think he's got the, the focus, the motivation, the work ethic, or the energy um, anymore. You know, it, it's too. easy. It's, it, it would be hard enough for someone like of our age, like, you know, relatively young um, to take on a massive project like this and try and see it through to completion. But for a man in his mid seventies, um, yeah. Like I, your, your, your creative energy, your, your drive, um, your motivation, all of those things, they do not get better with age. Uh, and I think that's probably where he's at. And his attention is already split between like a dozen other projects, which are, much easier, much more high profile and sexier. Like, hey, you know, be a fucking producer on a TV show. Of course, that's nice and easy. You get to go to these big awards ceremonies and, and conventions and have people like taking your picture and, and showering you with praise. That's all great. That stokes your ego and it doesn't require too much effort. Uh, um, you know, sitting in your a office. Video game, a video game is <laughs> hyper popular. And so you can be like, hey, that was our achievement. Look what we did. It's like Game of Thrones, George. <laughs> what are you doing? Exactly. But locking yourself away in a fucking office for, for a couple of years to write a book with no input from anyone, um, that's that's not an appealing prospect, is it? That because that requires a lot of just hard work and graft and, and it's and it's and it's difficult. And he probably just can't be bothered anymore. He also yeah, found I, out, you know, because you write the characters and the characters write the stories. He also recently found out that Jon Snow is trans and it just destroyed him. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's really devastating. Everyone's trans. Everyone's wonderfully, <laughs> fabulously gay. And you know, that's just, that's modern writing, I suppose. As far um, as I'm aware as well, he's he's got to figure out a lot of knots in his story. He's put certain characters in certain places and he needs them to be in other places for certain events. I remember there was one called the Miranese knot that people have talked about where he's been solving this problem for a while in his story, trying to make it so he can put people in particular places and stuff. So 
you got that, plus the fact that everyone hated the show's ending, and he probably had something similar. He would have built it differently. This is the, the theory as it stands. There's a lot of things in the books that give away that, oh, we could be heading for the show's ending, but with different developments and stuff, so it would be different. But knowing how everyone reacted, you know, surface level to, to the to the events, if you will, of, of the final season, he might be like, okay, I gotta scrap this shit. Like, everyone will fucking hate it. And maybe, you know, Nick's right to some degree. He's probably looking out, see what people have made up endings, see if they like them. They'll just be like, how can I implement them? Meanwhile, it's like, want to work on Elden Ring? Just come and have a fucking lunch with Miyazaki or whatever and talk to him about how this ring is shattered. It was powerful. Yeah, I'll take the uh, fucking mashed potatoes and sausages or whatever. And get some drinks. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, I don't know. Was, there was a king. He was he was nuts. Uh, does that sound good? They're like, yeah, man, yeah. Come in for you know a day. Just write some shit down and you'll we'll slap your name on it. Because they wanted him for the... Um, they would have added him into the project at like, the peak of Game of Thrones. Because this this was a project that was going for six years, and then by the time it comes out, it's like the guy who made, you know, the, <laughs> like, the thing. Yeah. Uh, um, so I don't know. I think you're right as well about the sexier projects. It's just like, can he, you? He looks at that sleepy cabin that's lonely in the woods. He's like, why would I go there when I can go to all these amazing meetings, work on these new projects? Can we take a moment to appreciate the creative genius of? George R. R. Martin coming up with a storyline for Elden Ring that involved the Mad King and a ring that was like <laughs> lost or destroyed. I mean, God, it's so fucking original. It's it's amazing. He was able to come up with this all on his own. I can't. We, uh, I, I think <laughs> you said more like in terms of Elden Ring, the story is almost like fucking irrelevant. It's just all about the world's building, <laughs> like the world exploration and the gameplay. Yeah. This should give you some impression, right? We did an EFAP stream that lasted i think eight nine hours deconstructing the whole game talking about it in in at length with i think at least five people who played all the games thoroughly throughout the course of from soft's history at least with starting with demon souls and you know just hundreds of hours packed into all of them we did a we did a bit on mechanics and then we had a section for the story to talk about it that lasted about 30 seconds and then we went back to the mechanics uh none of yeah. us have any clue what the story of this game is yeah, someone and, said that's what all Souls games are like. <laughs> it's, it's pretty much. I don't understand what George uh, did, but uh, I'm sure he helped with naming just, places and characters. Just having his name on it, like you say, is enough. Like, you know, give him his free lunch and uh, slap some money into his bank account, and uh, yeah, he'll be happy, you know? Um, Gary raised a good point in his video as well is that George made it, he made it big quite late in his life. Like, I think yeah. he was in his early 60s when. You know, uh, Game of Thrones came out, and like his series really like hit the big time um, in terms of like general acceptance and and um, recognition. And it's almost like he's now just making up for lost time. Like after spending most of his life toiling away in relative obscurity, now it's like ah, I'm getting all these amazing offers. Of course, I'm going to take them all. Why would I? Why would I waste time writing books now? It's like fuck that. Yeah, and I, I think he's just given up the 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 veil at this point. It's just like, oh no, I'm I'm working on Winter Winter. No, I'm doing it. Yeah, I'm doing it. And years later, he's like, you know what? I'm I, I can work on other shit. Fuck you. <laughs> it's just like, okay. I, I think it. Yeah. Whenever an author says like, oh, I have made some progress, you know, or or I made steady progress on my book, that's translation for I've done fuck all. Because I'm pretty sure I've said that exact <laughs> same thing to my editor. You know when I've when I've put off like editing a book or whatever, it's like, oh, how how are you getting on, drinker? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, I'm making steady progress. Thanks. <laughs> I'll come back to you in like a month. <laughs> and it's just yeah, it's just fucking. Uh, it's just how you cover for yourself, you know. It's a creative process, you know. We're working through it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that. people have this assumption that you know, but when you're at his kind of level. Um, or that just if you're an author in general or whatever that like you're super organized or you're super productive or you know you're you're dealing with these like you know incredibly high level concepts that a normal person couldn't understand it's not it's all nonsense like it's all just it's like having any project that you've got to do like if you're in a fucking office and you've got to fill out fucking expense reports or whatever it's the same exact principle you put it off because you don't want to do it for quite a while, and eventually you, you bodge job it and you rush it um, if it's not something you're enthusiastic about, and that's exactly what he's probably going through with this. Um, just 
yeah, putting it off, putting it off, maybe picking away at it a little bit, and then eventually it'll fart something out, and it'll be shit probably. <laughs> Sorry to be so uh, bleak have, about it. Have, no, but you're not... right. I mean, I think you're optimistic because you say eventually something is going to come out and it'll be shit. Well, the the something is going to come out there is pretty optimistic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm I'm being generous and saying like before he dies, he'll probably get Winds of Winter done. There's no way he'll get a Dream of Spring finished in his lifetime. It's not going to happen. Uh, the uh, without I haven't actually read read the the game of thrones books but perusing some of them the writing seems so laborious because he gets so his exposition is so detailed and and intricate and uh and woven it, it seems like you know it'd be a massive chore to write that uh to write that aspect of the books but i, I, I don't I know think... if it carries on like that through all of them but at the you know the first one when they get into the 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 history and the descriptions of the clothing and the crests and everything it's like god this is, this is. It's, it, it's my understanding that his narrative was relatively streamlined until I think a dance with dragons, and I, I, that's apparently by his own admission where he just went a bit mental, introducing like loads of extra characters, loads of extra subplots, um, and the the narrative which was just kind of going in in a relatively contained fashion just branched out into this insane like, you know cavalcade of different characters and, and and plot lines and stuff and it was just impossible to keep track of it all and essentially what he's done yeah. is made a rod for his own back um he's he's bitten off more than he can chew now with all the the sheer number of storylines he's got to try and wrap up um and it's just i don't know it was maybe just a bit of over ambition or, or just getting carried away with his own creativity um and maybe yeah, an editor should have but uh, he he lost his way it became too much. He became overwhelmed and called fits. He also lost his editor, apparently. Yeah, see, this is where an editor should have stepped in and said, nah, look, George, you're going way too far with all this stuff. You're never going to be able to tie all this stuff up. You need to pair it back a bit. Um, but mm -hmm. whoever, I think, was working with him, maybe he was just too successful by that point, and the editor was like, yeah, sure, whatever. Because this, is, I think, is what happens to authors if they become too successful and too big they get too much creative control and their editors just like let them do whatever the fuck they want um and whatever bad habits they've picked up are no longer getting compensated for they're just getting allowed to happen and if his bad habit is that he just doesn't know where to stop then there you go it's just going to get worse and worse yeah you well, gotta have uh, a good editor you yeah. you have to a lot of people don't realize that that is that is a core element of writing successfully is having someone who can tell you no uh, and tell you no a lot and you don't kill them. The, that's the follow up. Yeah. <laughs> There's also, like every single, like for whatever like minor success I've achieved as a writer, like every one of my books has been made better by editorial input. I can say that much. Like they've all been made movies. like. Sorry, that's that's the truth for movies as well. Uh, that uh, that if when a director is allowed to run completely free, doesn't always uh, mean that the movie is going to be good. You need someone to keep the writer in check. You need someone to keep the director in check. This is actually the secret behind the MCU's early success, because you had all of the directors working on the different installments, but they could never go completely wild with it because they had an editor type in Kevin Feige. Now, of course, Kevin Feige would have his own problems later on when he got a little bit too big for his britches. But for a good three faces there, that, that work relationship between a director carrying out the movie within the clearly defined restrictions of editor Kevin Feige, that worked wonders and, uh, and uh, created the biggest franchise in the world. And yeah, Hefty Joe says... Looking at you, George Lucas, another example of a filmmaker that loses all of the people that functioned as an editor for an author uh, for the prequels. You saw what happened there. Another example is uh, is um, uh, the filmmaker behind uh, uh, behind um, yeah Shyamalan. I forgot the movie. Like the Sixth Sense and stuff like that. Got too big. Didn't listen to any more input, and then he made Lady in the Water. Which was oh, all God. 
<laughs> yeah. Why did you say that name? <laughs> um, there was a, there was a question there. This is a kind of a relevant one, but I thought it was a good question. Uh, which was better, um, the Batman or No Way Home? Pretty sure I know Mahler's answer. Well, we gave him the same score on uh, uh, on EFAB. I know I prefer No Way Home. I found it more impactful emotionally, but uh, you know, well, what do you guys think? <laughs> I didn't watch either of them. And the Batman's three hours, it's almost guaranteed I will never watch it. <laughs> I'm, How about I'm you, a, Andre? I'll, I'll, I'll wait. I'll go last. Yeah, and actually, I'm not that big a fan of either of them. Um, of the two, I think I prefer... Yeah, I definitely prefer Spider-Man No Way Home. And it's yeah. a shame, because the Batman could have been such a great movie. It really, really could have been. But then they messed it up completely. Dude, I was ready to adore that my, movie. Uh, in, my, in my opinion. Yep. Uh, yeah, I, I'd be inclined to agree. Um, they, you know, they both had their merits. Like, for me, No Way Home was definitely the better film. Um, the Batman, um, if it hadn't been for that final act that was so like chaotic and just tacked on, for an action sequence at the end, I think it would have been excellent. Um, and it would have been probably within that tolerable length of about two and a half hours. Um, as it stands, it's just too bloated and it's it's trying to work in too much. Um, so yeah, that that was probably would have been my pick. I would have picked No Way Home over the Batman. All I know is my live streams go three hours, and if you can't edit your thing to be shorter than my live stream, you deserve the sword. Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> Excuse you. What well, about Lord of the Rings? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Lord of the Rings gets a pass because a pass. Uh, it gets a pass because they made it in a time before premium television was a real, like, successful thing. But if they made, like, if the Lord of the Rings trilogy didn't exist, it would be the Amazon series, right? It would be on Amazon. It'd be an hour long episodes like Game of Thrones and it'd be magnificent. It, In my opinion, it may be better if they were able, again, keeping the vision of the Lord of the Rings trilogy, but with the ability to do seasonal, uh, you know, 10 hour uh, portions of the movie. So three seasons, 10 episodes a season. They have 10 hours of time, but it's broken up into individual digestible subplots with the greater story arc that goes through there. I think they would have crushed it and they could have kept in all of the little things that they left out of Lord of the Rings that the fans really wanted stuff like Tom Bombadil, etc. cetera. And, uh, and, and that would be that, but it wouldn't be you sitting through the movie, but Lord of the Rings gets a pass because that formula hadn't really been cracked at the time. Um, and the the production values on on even the premium TV shows that were on HBO and Cinemax at the time weren't they weren't that high, but now they are. And I think I think if they did it today, they would do it that way, and it'd be a massive success. Nick, you know what? They actually could do that right now. They have the footage uh, of the um, of of Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings because you have like the extended versions of the three right. movies, right? Those extended versions are in reality extremely shortened down versions of everything that was filmed. They could easily be like six, seven hours per movie. They have that footage. Yeah, and so that's what they did one into hour, hour long Max episodes and you've got like a six episode yeah. season essentially if for HBO each movie. Max right. decided to that uh, that we're gonna contact Peter Jackson and we're gonna recut everything he filmed <laughs> And we're gonna do an HBO Max series that has like twice the running, or not twice, but like certainly two po one point five times the running time of the extended edition of the movies. They could totally do that. Do it and fill there. in fill in some gaps too. Again, like yeah. they could they could then shoot in uh, like a Tom Bombadil section or whatever. Do oh that. God, no. <laughs> Do that. There's some things out. in that book they do not translate well into movies. <laughs> what him walking through the woods singing those weird Just songs? Say, yeah, and like you know, <laughs> they give the ring to him, and he's like, "Oh, it's a funny little thing," and putting it on, and it doesn't affect him, and then throwing it away. It's like, yeah, that's that's gonna really undermine the power of this this central, you know, this central antagonist of the whole trilogy. And it makes yeah. Tom Bombadil such a lovable but also despicable character. It's like. Oh, here's here's this guy who's powerful enough to deal with this thing, 
and the, he could he could easily take it on as a burden and and be completely immune to the rest of the world but he doesn't because he just doesn't give a shit <laughs> well that that's what they because they mentioned it in the book they're like wait a minute can't tom bombadil just take it to mordor and fucking destroy it for us and they're like nah he'd eventually get distracted and drop it or something like he just wouldn't care because <laughs> he's so fucking stoned um and so yeah they just they, they left him out of it which kind of just made me wonder why tolkien put him in in the first place like that whole segment is a little bit weird i think it's uh, i think the purpose of it is to show that there you know sometimes there are uh there are other which uh, are surface better options but they're not the right option you know it's not the and, and it's not necessarily uh the proper hero's task to give to give up the burden just because someone else might be able to do it better or that's easier, yeah. so that's uh, that's my take on it. But but I, getting back to the thing, I think if if they did that, I think it could be great. And if they recut it, the trick is always editing it out so that each show is a show in unto itself, an episode unto itself, where you you do that. And I think they did that with Hateful Eight, right? Hateful Eight is available as a four part miniseries because yes, it's such it a is. fucking long movie. Um, oh. It's vastly superior. I didn't yeah. know that. Nice. Yeah. The the. Oh God! This the uh, there we go. <laughs> no, keep him away. Im imagine <laughs> what might have been. <laughs> oh no, Bilbo with Jesus. <laughs> it's like from the moment you 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 pick up in the Shire, it's just everything looks like fucking Mordor. That's what like <laughs> that's what Zach would do with it. <laughs> Oh, we need it to be as, gr as grim and dark as possible. I'd probably take that over the rings of power, though. Mm. I mean, honestly, I'm I'm just now curious to see what the hell it's going to be when it comes out. You know, is it uh, is it as shit as the trailers make it seem? Is it going to be as preachy and woke as we we fear? Is it going to surprise us? Like, there's always a potential there that it could be something halfway decent. You just, you never quite know. I'm um, holding out hope. I'm holding out hope. I'm I'm trying to take the minority position. And say, you know what? Maybe it'll be. Maybe it'll be okay. It'll have a little bit of woke in it, but it'll you'll be able to digest it, and and the rest of it'll carry. I I, I just I, it feels like one of those things. I cannot predict this one. I just don't know where it's going to go. Oh. I'm I'll predict so it's Walker than Walkerton, though. I'll just based yeah. on who is making it, uh, the the production behind it that it comes under uh, from from um, the head of Amazon, who is card carrying SJW of the highest order, Jennifer Salki. So um, yeah, Chad's calling me out. They know what I want. Just some elf tits. That's all I need. You do that, and it's. I'll give it a ten out of ten. I mean, an elf sex scene would be pretty good. I'm not gonna lie. Ten out of ten. Also, an orc one. You got to balance it out, but yeah, yeah. Because we never, we've not seen really female orcs, have we? I think we talked about this during our two towers stream. Like they seem to just hatch in the ground. It's really weird. Yeah. Well, aren't they? Aren't orcs technically abducted elves that are corrupted over a long process? And tormented. I, I think that's how they were formed originally. I don't know then what the subsequent generations were or how they were bred or whatever. But yeah, like yeah. I say, when you see them in, in Isengard, they seem to be just like in like sacks that are Yeah, that vestigial are sacks in... underground. Yeah, and it's like I don't really do you have to grow orcs? <laughs> do you plant them like trees? I don't know. Uh yeah, what what about some like hairy dwarf boobs? That'd be good. We get some gruff beard on beard I, I, wanna, yeah. <laughs> I just want to yeah I just want to see a dwarf that looks like Gimli but with boobs <laughs> like, Yo, they, well, see the, since the dwarf women have the beards too they could have like the dwarf lesbian sex scene but it could be two guys with vagina it'd be perfect this you, is you'd never know mid. yeah you, you wouldn't be able to tell That'd I can make this show I can Amazon tag me in I'll make your woke show for you and I'll make it way better this is the thing, and like you can watch those dwarves getting it on, and you can project anything onto them because they can be <laughs> anything you identify with. They can fulfill your fantasies because they all look basically the same. Exactly. Uh, perfect. It's it's yeah, it's it's a social justice paradise in Moria. Come join us there. Look how well it look how well it turned out. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's just, man, I, 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 like I say, I've got no idea what this show is ultimately going to turn out as. Um, I'll just watch it. I'll watch it when it comes out and see ultimately what they do with it. You never quite know, I suppose. Um, the clock's ticking down, though. It is. Um, yeah, the, one of the other things that came out recently is that they have they've cast a new James T. Kirk in Star Trek. Oh Praise be to to Alex Kurtzman. Um, so this is for their Strange New World show. They have they have now got a new Captain Kirk, who's not actually Captain, because if I understand it right, this is like a prequel to the original Star Trek show. Yes and no. Um, in terms of timeline, it's a prequel in that it's set to be four but it's a completely separate continuity. It can't legally uh, be an actual prequel to the original series because this is set in a different continuity altogether, although this is set in the prime timeline. Now, this is something that we've broken down on Midnight Sedge, how the prime timeline, that is in fact not the, the original series. That's just something that you have been made to believe. It's a bad robot lie that's being fed to you. Uh, the original series was never ever referred to as the prime timeline until uh, the um, uh, the bad robot era movies begin that's when they invented that term and it's only meant to for you to think that's the original series mm -hmm. timeline when in reality it's another timeline of their own making well that's i'm going to and I'm, yeah, I was very happy to see Kirk being cast, and that's actually something that we reported more than a year ago, that Strange New Worlds would feature a new Kirk with a twist. A twist, yeah. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can bring up a little picture here just so we can compare. Uh, Captain from... Jemina Kirk, the black woman. That'd be great. He does uh, well. He is still a white man, so I'll give him. I'll give him something for that. But well, uh... they they found other ways to subvert him. Oh, tell me yeah, he's a well, we'll now. Yeah, we'll talk about this in a second. So, uh, let me just share. Uh, <laughs> Captain James T. Rands Kirk. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, there we go. Size and... Oh. It turns out he has a stepping on fetish. Every time Ahura go. walks by, he lays down on the ground, she steps on him. So, there's, there's the new Kirk. There's the old one. And there, there seems to be a bit of a difference there. I'm not going to lie. I'm not really seeing the resemblance. Yeah, the new Kirk has chest and shoulders like mine. <laughs> That's not good. It would be great if you could bring up like a picture of just him because they're like those shoulder pads are just plain ridiculous. I think and you they, can kind of see thing. it there. Like if yeah, you look yeah. at his right shoulder, like it's definitely, yeah, it's really sticking up there. He looks like a pretty weedy guy that they've tried to bulk up a little bit. Yeah. Tried and failed. Yeah, badly. Um, and yeah, the um, so yeah, there, there's your little comparison here. For, for for the records, like William Shatner will always be Kirk for me, and I don't give a fuck about Chris Pine or this other dork that they've got playing him. Um, yeah, he was the one and only Captain Kirk for me. Uh, he nailed it, and I don't think anyone's gonna be able to replace him. Yeah, this dude doesn't look like a brash, adventurous lady killer, right? He looks like well, he's chugging Soylent. He's. I. I think. Um, I can see him the, being the kind of guy that likes to have a good cry and then talk about his feelings um, <laughs> in a hallway somewhere. <laughs> Spock's entire it's like, job now is just listening to Kirk crying. Yeah, it's like ah, oh, straight of command. It's just too much. I can't do it. <laughs> and then you just go in and you know, talk talk it through. Have a, a good pant wet and cry, you know, maybe kiss Spock a little bit and uh yeah, it'd be good to go. Yeah. Um but that that's I don't know, man. It feels like they, they just wouldn't allow a character like Kirk anymore. Not yeah, not in his original really form. No. He's he's too Yeah, he's too toxic, I suspect. Yeah, he's brash, impulsive, and often correct. That, that you can't killer. have that for a man. So you don't even get to have Picard. No, we got we got a confused old man who who likes to pretend that he's Picard. It's uh, it's just the medication talking, you know. But he's not though, right? He's an AI now. 
or whatever. He's, yeah, he's a yeah, robot. So it's a he's robot got a robot body. original. Yeah, that's such a bizarre <laughs> writing choice. Yeah. And that's not you. That's what bothers me about all this, uh, the whole like download your consciousness thing. That's still not me though. Cause once I download my consciousness, I'm still here. Like I didn't move into the new thing. So if you kill me, I'm still angry about it. Yeah. It's like, it's like if you photocopy something, the original's still there. Like you just made a copy of it. Well, you that's all it is. The concept of continuity and what it means to be human and the self and stuff. How, how deep we get in the stream, huh? Well, like I'm prepared to go real deep, Mauler. <laughs> you got to play Soma, drinker. Okay, that well, game covers uh, this topic quite a bit. Yeah, he only watches the rocket escape at the end, and it's not him, and he's not on it. Ah! Oh my god, have you have you actually played Soma? <laughs> I just kind of watch playthroughs and stuff. Oh, okay. Like, what what I'll, am I going to do? Actually, it. play it myself. You know, you know, like um, game. You know, yeah. <laughs> Anyone who's watched me play Horizon uh, Forbidden West knows that I'm not a gamer. I can you barely even that? make the yeah. controller work. Uh, no, I'm it? almost there, I think. Oh, um, okay. I've been kind of caught up um, basically watching TV recently and I haven't really played it. Are you uh, you going to play Elden Ring after that? Or are you, gonna you better play Elden yes, Ring. Yes, I'm going to play <laughs> Elden Ring. What I'm going to do, right, is wait until it's no longer relevant in the slightest and no one gives a shit. Then I'll start streaming myself playing it. There you go. Yes. Perfect. Um, yeah, I, um, I gotta say, Elden Ring is uh, is one of the most fun games I've played in a while. Like where I just genuinely want to go play it, uh, and I, that has not happened for me in a AAA title in a long time. I've heard people, a lot of people, just say the same thing. Like it's just really fun to just get absorbed in the world, just go out exploring. Don't really give a shit about the story. Just like have fun with it. Yeah, yeah, man, and the, around killing shit. Yeah, the story is irrelevant. Um, and and also like you find the thing I find with all the souls and souls like games is the writing gets really like pretentious. It's so it's so dark and blah, blah. it's so it's all the same. Uh, so you can just tune it out entirely. I skip through every single thing that said. Uh, I just fast forward through the dialogue. It's a waste. Um, I just go hit <laughs> stuff with a hammer. A lot of people in chat. <laughs> Uh, video game stories are bad universally they're all oh bad my all the God. time take right, that because not everyone here too good bioshock <laughs> <laughs> there you go counted <laughs> you, can um, call, you can call out exceptions all day but i'll tell you all video game storytelling is bad dude it should be storytelling right now is kind of in a, in a tough spot <laughs> yeah not just video games we got right we got, we got to improve all over the place but uh well, that's yeah. because storytelling's gone in general. Uh, storytelling has, and and this is my actual, this is not a criticism of video games, right? I don't think video games should have good storytelling because the storytelling should give way to game mechanics and fun and play. Um, whereas other mediums, mm. it should not. And in mm. other mediums, it's giving way to other things, uh, agendas, uh, injections, producers, whatever you need. Um, will will distract from the storytelling vision of the the actual creator, and so that's that's my that's my rant on storytelling. It's fucking dead because everything else is killing it, and no one can just tell a story. You got to be concerned about how the story is going to play. Uh, will you be canceled for it? Everything else, it's fucking irritating. I think there that, was um, a well told story in games can really marry the mechanics to it and. Uh, I don't know. Say, for example, you find a big boss. If you have a narrative reason to want to kill this thing, then you know that can help. I guess my careful. narrative reason is that it's there. I, I think but with I'm a lot of games, like the, the story kind of dips in and out. Like you, you do your game mechanics bit to achieve a certain objective, and it's like okay, then back into the story. Um, yeah, like and I think cutscene that's... time sort of thing. Yeah, pretty much. And like for me, that's fine because I guess you just get into that rhythm of like, okay, that's just how games function, and you understand like there's limits to what you can have. Like you, you can't have the story interjecting into like just a boss fight or regular kind of play. You need to like back off a little bit and let the player just have fun and explore, and then get more story going. Sony's Padra of walking simulators would like to have a word with you right now. The, yeah, this is the problem, isn't it? It's like when the game <laughs> slows you down to a crawl and it's like, right, we're basically giving you a scripted cutscene and you've got minimal control over it while it's happening. Um, and it's it's to the point where you're like, why didn't they make a movie? Why didn't they make a TV show? Sometimes. Yeah, pretty much. Um, and so they, they need to realize what players will, will put up with, I guess. But that's just, well... 
You know Let's what? just keep you on getting skip, over eager. Skip all the cutscenes in Elden Ring. You'll be fine. Really? <laughs> do it. I don't, do don't it. Even I know encourage what to do. you. Well, you can if you want to. Um, I didn't because I'm a proper gamer, Nick. I'm, a, I'm one of those <laughs> OGs, okay? Got to respect the weird cutscenes with the tentacle people chopping off their own heads and then getting swords out of their heads or something. That's narratively satisfying, all right? It's very, it's very important. Again, get big hammer, pump strength, crush everything. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah just for people who are in chat. Uh, yeah, Mr. H is fucking, uh, yeah, his internet has died on him. So he's he's not been able to join us. We, we saw a few seconds of him yeah, we, on we, the screen. We got one sentence from him and it was completely out of sync with the way his mouth was moving because of his internet. It was quite funny. <laughs> because <laughs> he messaged me and said like people have been on at me for like a year now to like stream with the drinker and now it's fucking happening and my internet's completely like banjaxed um, so what can I do no. um, but yeah we'll, we'll get him back up I'm sure um, but yeah I thought it was just up in Scotland that we had shit internet you know I thought I thought you civilized people down in England were alright oh, with it man. Have you ever, like, I was watching a stream on Twitter. This shit blew my mind, and I thought I was good with tech. So I was watching a streamer who was um, like, oh, you know, I need to grab um, Elden Ring. Uh, it didn't install last night. And I was just, I was listening. I was like, oh, well, I guess no Elden Ring today for them. And they're like, yeah, I'll just start the download now. And they're like, over 200 megabytes per second. And I was like, excuse Holy me. <laughs> I was like, I'm stuck all the way down to like eight, which, by the way, is fast compared to a lot of the people that I know. And I was just like, how are you getting that much? What? Who did you sacrifice? <laughs> like, how does he... I, uh, this is I where you've know. got like a gold plated fucking Ethernet connection running right into your bedroom, you know, <laughs> just like absolute perfect. I, I just I feel like I'm out of the loop on how good internet can be these days. And then you have a... <laughs> that didn't sound good. <laughs> uh, Andre, you all right there? Yeah, I'm okay. Uh, Talk to us, Andre. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, just, was, um, the the bottle is fine. The... That's the most important thing. Oh shit! Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Save the bottle. Save the booze. All is well. <laughs> Save the world. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, all, all I was saying is just the, the internet speed baffles me these days. You have someone like Mr. H Reviews who can barely get to say a word where some people are just like, oh, only 150 meg today. Uh -huh. well, yeah, fine. bastards. <laughs> I mean, I guess like if you live in the center of London or something, yeah, you're going to get amazing internet. It's just that's... See, a friend of mine can barely play video games because of his ping, and he lives in the center of London. And I was like, aren't you supposed to have good internet? And he was like, yeah. <laughs> like, all right, then. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, maybe shit provider or something. Maybe, yeah. yeah. Or shit maybe package. I don't know. Yeah. Bad um, wiring. Anything. Yeah, I mean, it's not great in my neck of the woods, but I mean, generally, it's acceptable for, like, you know, streaming and, and doing stuff like this, doing a bit of gaming. You know, I've Mine... not had too many problems. Mine's good or bad, depending on who I'm talking to. Because if I'm talking to, like, I think Rags' internet is way better than mine, but mine is, like, way better than, like, Jay's. So it's all relative. I don't know. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. mine's good, I think. Sort of. Yeah. It's like if it, needs, if, if it does the things I need it to do day to day, like, yeah, it's all right. I just get yeah. annoyed that there's not an option. Like where I live, there's not an option to buy better internet. Like there's not an amount of money I can say, put better internet in my house. And they'll go, okay, at this amount of money, I will. They're just like, nope, we won't. Like, We've got no office for that. But I know you could run a fiber line like to my house. Like I know that's theoretically possible. So how much does that cost? And they're like, nah, we won't do it. But I I'll pay for it. <laughs> what what do you need? <laughs> who who needs to die? What happens? How many hookers? I, like, I don't know. Sure. <laughs> what do you need? getting sacrificed? <laughs> like I'm I was oh. Yeah, I was remembering the days of dial up. Like, I don't know if you oh guys are old enough to remember this oh, shit, yeah. but um yeah, back in the early days of the internet, like I remember if you were trying to dial up um, in the evening, like six, seven o'clock, when everyone else was trying to do it, you just wouldn't get on. You couldn't do it. You'd have to wait like 20, 30 minutes to finally get a connection. And even then, it was like, sh you know, piece of shit. Like it would take you like five minutes to download a single JPEG. But that's, that's yeah. the world we lived in back then. Yeah, those were the days. Ever, um... Those were crazy days. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> I I remember trying to watch Lost season one when it was coming out, and I remember having to be like, load up the episode, and then go to school, come back, and it should be loaded. <laughs> like, <that's... laughs> oh man, do you remember? Because that's used that's the way they used to stream video was like you would just stream until it would just keep going and going and going until the full thing was done. But then YouTube, I can't remember when they did the update and other places, but it caps at like five percent of the video from where you are. So that they can better, you know, disseminate the bandwidth and stuff. And I was just like, no. Yeah, that <laughs> sucks. I remember, um, yeah, fuck, man. I remember going to internet cafes back in the, the late 90s, right? And you had to pay by the hour for, like, internet yeah. access. <clears throat> and I was I was desperate to know about the new Resident Evil game that they were making. It's like, this was when Resident Evil 2 was in development. And they had, like, some um, gameplay footage online that they'd uploaded. Like, little 30-second clips of it. And, and so I had to set that to download while I was in the internet cafe, and it took like 50 minutes of my my hour, like time that I'd been allocated. Um, and then right at the end, I finally got to watch this little tiny clip, and I was like so fucking pleased that that was what I'd done, and it didn't even feel like a wasted time. <laughs> like yeah. that's that's what it was back then. Damn. Yeah, it's uh, as much as we complain now. Like at least we've. Um, We've got reasonable time for actually being able to do things. Yeah, yeah. how much better it well, is. Well, I remember see, like waiting five minutes and then you'd see something. And then you'd wait five minutes and then you'd yeah. see the top of Cindy Crawford's head. And then like 30 minutes later, it would load down to her boobs. Yeah. Perfect. Man, you, you had like, to be yes. a discerning customer to get porn back then because you really had to think <laughs> carefully about which one you wanted to go for. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it was a real commitment, you know. <laughs> That's why I always stuck with a recognizable name. You had to, you had to. Do yeah, it. yeah, it's all you knew what you were getting. <laughs> but every so often, you would opt to live dangerously, try something <laughs> new. Eric, a librarian no, asking if you need help. No. Like, no, 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 <laughs> no. <laughs> um. Yeah, <laughs> fuck. I'm just. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm just looking at chat here. Some of the comments are absolute gold. <laughs> <laughs> Up all night, and you'd see eight women. <laughs> yeah, wanks took longer in those times. Yeah, <laughs> you had to pace it. <laughs> uh, yeah, those were the days. I'm pretty satisfied with my or the, with the Norwegian connection in general. Apart from sometimes when we're live and I sound more like a robot than i otherwise do so that's always fun but um yeah i i think at the start of this stream actually mine my internet might have been a little bit shaky because i was um i think my image just disappeared off the screen for a few seconds and there was times when i couldn't hear like you guys properly you were kind of robot and and mm -hmm. it must have been my connection that was fucking up but yeah it seems all right so far um might i suggest a couple of super chats since we're all here like yeah, yeah. And we're, we're capable of answering simple questions, so we should give this a try. All right, just give me one second while I bring it up. Because I know you guys have been super chatting all evening. Uh, okay, so the first one is from, well, it scrolls down. Yeah, so it was Chuxenhausen. He said, part one of four. So last Wednesday night, I went on a date with a 23-year-old lady with daddy issues. I'm 34. And what I thought would end early instead went to her place that involved a pole dance. Excellent. Uh, to Jewel of the Fates. <laughs> Fucking oh. hell. That's an that's a interesting one to dance to. Um, and legendary, legendary night of sexual deviance from having her waterfall on the bed to, to me screaming at Climax louder than Sam Neill in Event Horizon. <laughs> Okay, but before that, we watched absolutely anything. The 2015 sci-fi film starring Simon Pegg. Um, I had had the Monty Python crew there too. I've got to say, it was way funnier than I thought, with the dry humor and an outlandish plot of an everyman given god mode with all the flaws. Plus, Kate Beckinsale is gorgeous too. Anyways, that would be a fun happy hour to do one day. So, absolutely anything with Simon Pegg. In 2015. Hmm. The way they described it sounds like um, Bruce Almighty. Average yeah. guy getting given God powers. And every man with God mode uh, with all the flaws, uh, plus Kate Beckinsale is gorgeous, which is, she is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Can't argue with that one. Um, yeah, sounds alright, actually. But it's weird, because I, I was generally quite well across Simon Peck movies, but 
<laughs> I haven't seen that one. Uh, what's it called? So it's absolutely anything. Let me just see it. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, here it is. Uh, yeah, British sci fi film directed by Terry Jones. Uh, yeah, so it's first. Oh, man, yeah. So it's the first movie to feature all the living Monty Python members since Monty Python's The Meaning of Life back in 1983. Fucking hell, that's Damn. impressive that they got them all together for that. Yeah. I'm surprised I haven't heard of this movie. Uh, it was also the... F so, yeah. I've heard of it. Final movie I directed heard. by Terry Jones, and it's also the final one with Rob Robin Williams. I heard of it, but I didn't hear anything about it. Like, I've seen it scrolling through, you know, like a catalog or whatever. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, it only did, what, 6.3 million at the box office, so it must have been, yeah, a pretty limited release. Yeah, funny. Oh, well, cool. Um, RRTNZ said, uh, Hail Drinker, great stream with Neil Marshall. Maybe that will inspire you to check out Black Sails, at least episode one. Uh, have a shot on me. Cheers. Thank you very much. I will, indeed. Um, yeah, uh, also from him was also 100% agree with you um, and Marshall regarding Lord of the Rings versus The Hobbit. Lord of the Rings' use of New Zealand is breathtaking, sorry, New Zealand's breathtaking scenery made it look spectacular, whereas The Hobbit's reliance on CGI made it look cartoonish. I know, and I was in it. There you go. This wow. guy was in The Hobbit, and he reckons it was shit. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it's your fault then. Yeah, like, yeah, like yeah. That guy. You were there. You were an extra, but you're like, it's your fault the movie was bad. Jakey <coughs> uh, Fozel said, uh, Hey, it's James Kelly, but I decided hearing my actual name on live stream got kind of weird. Well, I'm going to say it again, James Kelly. Uh, anyway, I'm dubbing this uh, my birthday stream as I turn 29 tomorrow. Also, Frodo destroyed the ring on March 25th. Holy shit. Yeah. So we're, we're almost on ring day. Oh, my gosh. Celebrate. We didn't talk about the new series that comes out tomorrow on uh, Amazon. Uh, it's the uh, Lizzo. Lizzo's Fat Ladies uh, Cheerleading Camp or whatever. What the fuck? I have no you idea. you guys going to watch about. that? Lizzo's Fat Lady Camp? What? That's not what it's called. <laughs> <laughs> You know who Lizzo is, right? No. No, we're not American. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, she's a giant, hideous, um, plus-size model, we'll call her. And uh, she has some some body positivity, like cheerleading tryout show. Like, imagine if... Oh, uh, damn. That, yeah, that right. Dallas... Yeah, looking it up right now. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh. I'm going to inflict this on all of you people. <laughs> no. <laughs> you it's you see it because girl. I have to as well. Uh, right, let's go. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> uh, what's suitable here? None of it. Nothing is suitable. Oh, no, it's I don't want to do it. It's, uh... There's like a, a pretty scantily clad picture in there somewhere. Uh, I know because I have the misfortune of finding it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's called Big Girls. Oh, damn, big girls! Yeah. It's her. She's uh, it's like one of those stupid shows where they she's auditioning dancer backup dancers, and they're all her size or larger. And it, God, it looks just like a nightmare. Oh, I pity that stage that they're dancing upon. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you can imagine like a, an engineer like Scotty underneath it, like ah, oh, Captain, the stage <laughs> can't take anymore. <laughs> This, I mean, is this, yeah, is this where we're at now? It's like, um, this is celebrated. Like, this is a good thing to do to yourself. Um, this is how you should be living. Man, that's a bit sad, really. Uh, what's no. this? Look up Tess Holiday, too. No, I don't want to no. do that. Oh, my gosh. There's, uh, there's some other large lady model, apparently. Who's complaining about Delta's uh, seat belts on their airplanes? Because <laughs> she's, she's like, it's embarrassing to have to ask for a seat belt extender. It's like, good. <laughs> you should be yeah. embarrassed. Stop it. 
Uh, because it's it, physics comes into it at a certain point, doesn't it? With flying, yes. it's like, well, you're the sheer mass and weight of you, like actually can unbalance the plane and requires more fuel to get you to your destination. So, yeah, you you should uh, you should feel a little bit bad about that. You know, yeah, it's not and, really uh, set up to peop to cope with people of your your dimensions. My favorite part was one of her commenters said. Uh, a size 14 should never have to ask for a seatbelt extension. It's like, oh, buddy, that's not a size 14. <laughs> 14. <laughs> you got the, the one and the four mixed up there, mate. <laughs> that's nowhere well, near I think that, that's, uh, that size 14 should be grateful that they weren't asked to move uh, to, because of the weight distribution of the plane. Or buy an extra seat. Yep. Right? Yeah, because, yeah, that uh, can happen, can to, it? Like, you yeah, can be asked yeah. to buy an extra seat if you're that big. Yeah, absolutely. But also, like, um, as if it's really, really bad, depending on the luggage and the other passengers, they may even ask you to move somewhere else uh, if you fit in, like, two seats, uh, if it's a small plane for, like, the distribution of weight so yeah. that it's relatively even. Yeah, yeah, yeah. because I've, uh, I've totally heard of that. Planes operate on the same physics as boats. Uh, it's just floating. And it's, it's a different fluid. Uh, and so you can't you can't overbalance one side. It it doesn't work. <laughs> it's the center of gravity. Yep. <laughs> and you do not want to shift the center we need of to gravity of the plane. We need to jettison some ballast. Well, I know who's <laughs> first in line. Uh, oh, anyway, man. moving on. Um, Z Thogaber says, Drinker, to, uh, April 21st is the anniversary of the murder of Captain Blake and crew on the Elizabeth Dane off the cliffs of Antonio Bay. This is this is a reference to the fog, isn't it? Uh, how about a video or live stream to celebrate the film, The Fog? Oh, there you go. Yeah, The Fog or John Carpenter in general. Uh, yeah, fucking the, the Fog's a great movie. Um, that's probably a good Halloween one for me to cover because I've done a lot of his movies already i've got a bit of a thing for john carpenter he does some yeah, good yeah. stuff how much did you love john carpenter's vampires uh it was all right yeah it was pretty i good. love that movie yeah james woods cracks me up so like i don't care how good the movie is james woods beating up that priest is one of the funniest scenes to me <laughs> <laughs> i think it's you know he, he's done you know, movies that were a bit more slapsticky, like uh, They Live, but then he's done great stuff, like The Thing. You know, it's just like yeah. proper, brilliant atmospheric horror. You know, the, the guy's uh, the guy's done a hell of a career. He's also done shite, like Ghosts of Mars. But you know, yeah, but it, uh, someone brought up Prince of Darkness, great movie. Yeah, yeah, that yeah I reviewed an, it. Amazing movie. No, he's an incredible director. I just wish that he could get an actual Norwegian speaker. For the Norwegian in the thing. Because oh yeah, yeah, like, like in the, the beginning. Thing, like in the, oh. Yeah, in the beginning, that guy actually speaks Norwegian, but his accent is really atrocious. Oh really? Like, is he is he just like an American? This. Yeah, yeah. Speaking Norwegian as a second language or something. something what does something he actually like say during that scene? By the way, what he says uh, is that um, uh, move around. That is not a donkey. Move, idiots. That's what he's saying. Right. So it's literally saying they are again bicha, meaning that's not the doggy. I'm not a doggy. <laughs> Fair dues. Um well he's right, I suppose. Um JS Pena said Mr. H reviews, sweet. Yeah, it would have been if if he <laughs> if he could have come on. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Can't legislate for the internet, I guess. Um Unhinged said tired and at work. Entertain me as no others can with your mouths. Well, I think we have, hmm. hopefully. Yeah, all right, all right. <laughs> Shall we dance next? Uh, Nikki D said, do you think Thor will be respected in his next film? <laughs> Fucking no. Uh, <laughs> or will they double down on the humor and write him as a deconstructed joke like his brother? Uh, yeah, he's going to get fucked. Uh, it's all it's going to be all about Valkyrie and um, Lady Thor. What's her name? Jane. Yeah. God, uh, it's going to be a disaster. And it's know. a shame because Taika Waititi is good at this stuff, but man, he's going too let's far down the store road. Let's just wait and see, though, because I agree on paper. It looks really, really bad, but it's all in the execution. And with his brand of humor, 
maybe he's able to pull uh, some kind of cat out of the bag here. Well, I would bet Possibly. on it, but, uh, but I wouldn't rule it out either. Thor Ragnarok is one of those movies, like, the more I watch it, the less I like it. Um, it, it was it when I first saw it, I was like, "Yeah, this is good." It's like it's lifted Thor out of the the doldrums of like the dark world and stuff, and it's actually like brought a bit of humor into it, and it seems to have found the right balance. But then, whenever I rewatch it, I'm like, "Oh, right, they they just really turned Thor into a complete clown throughout the whole movie." Like, you should definitely have that humor there. It's just you don't need to actually like humiliate your main character throughout the yeah. whole film like there needs to be some kind of like serious aspect to it and just feels like it never really gets there it doesn't allow itself to get serious at any point i don't really think um infinity war kind of picks that up for that uh, for ragnarok almost yeah um, i'll give it kudos for the for the visual still this is the only movie that actually has done Jack Kirby justice by bringing his visuals to to life. I mean, that's one of the things that I hated the most with the Eternals, that it's an adaptation of a comic book that was written and drawn by the great Jack Kirby, one of the greatest visualists there ever was. And instead of doing a visual tribute to him, which they did in Thor Ragnarok, they just made it like, dark uh, no not dark but like just colorless colorless and sandy and desert-y and couldn't be further from jack kirby whereas thor ragnarok at the very least that played visual tribute to jack kirby and mm -hmm. i thought it was a pretty it's fun movie bless me definitely colorful i'll say that and like yeah it's definitely got the humor in it it's just awesome yeah, score as well yeah the score is pretty good they, they really went for that well everything like the title sequence and everything it's like that that really kind of retro 80s vibe to it um i guess what that's a just style what not moving yeah mm -hmm. um but yeah like as paradigm was saying there watch iron man still just perfect the original um yeah i actually did rewatch it recently it just happened to be on and i was like oh fuck it i'll give it a watch again and yeah just blown away even by how refined it was as a movie even back then like you know being the first film in the MCU, you'd think it would be kind of rough now, mm. but it just flows perfectly as a film. Oh, as it's a one story. of the better ones, isn't it? Like, it does all the things that we often are like, wait, why isn't this scene in this new movie where the hero does the blah, blah, blah? Like, missing it means that we can't get invested in blah, blah, blah. And it's like the amount of times he fails in that film before he becomes like a strong and confident Iron Man. Um, and the amount you get to learn about him so quickly as a person before he's put in this scenario that's just so like, oh shit, how will he deal with it? It's a really good uh, blueprint, that movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, 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 they don't care. <laughs> it really established like the the balance of, you know, witty, wisecracking humor and, you know, more serious, dramatic moments. Uh, yeah. And yeah, like you say, the, the process of actually developing the Iron Man suit and learning how to use it and taking it out into combat for the first time and like Tony just thinking he can take direct action to like resolve the the, the threat and take out the bad guys. And ultimately it's it's something much more complex than that. That it sets the tone for his character throughout the whole MCU in that one movie. Um, well, yeah, really the the initial Marvel movies were just, they were really good at setting the stage and they carried, they carried any of the weaknesses of later movies through, through so much of, I mean, heck through, uh, the infinity war, right? Like you got so invested so quickly in these characters and their stories and how they did it early on that you were willing to tolerate nonsense later in the movies because you're like, okay, but I need to see how this goes, how it ends. Uh, it's a testament, I think, to how well they did on those first movies. Yeah, absolutely. I, think so. I mean, yeah. that's what the entire success of the MCU is built on, is phase one. It's everything leading up to and including the Avengers. I mean, the Avengers was a complete unparalleled hit at the time. There had never been anything like it. There was a movie that sucked the air out of every other release, no matter how major, the rest of that summer. And that was a testament to the success of the five movies leading up to it. Yeah. yeah. 
Uh, here's one for for you, um, Andre. So the next super chat, can you read it out in Norwegian? So I'll, I'll I guess I'll read it out and then you see if you can do it in Norwegian because apparently Solar Sailor loves that language. Okay. Yeah, sure. Uh, right. I can do so, some spontaneous translation to Norwegian if you want. Okay. So James Bursey says, "Okay, drinker, if you don't get an interview with Nick Cage, then the prophecy will be fulfilled, and we will suffer a thousand years of the message. No pressure." I know that's quite long, but... Uh, uh, okay, drunkard. Uh, hvis vi ikke får et intervju med Nicholas Cage, så vil vi alle sammen lide tusen år under The Message. Under you made all that up. <laughs> <laughs> that's, the, that's, the, that's the message in Norwegian, this budskapet. Ah, okay. Brilliant. Budskapet. Mm. Yeah, oh, you nailed it. That was good. <laughs> nice. Uh, yeah, so anyway, I, I apparently I do have to get an interview with Nick Cage. So, hey, Nick, if you're watching this, the drinker's uh, up for doing an interview with you. Come on, you can join the VIP lounge. It'll be good. Um, Daniel Tucker says, Mr. H got uh, here. We'll stay for a drink or two. Well, <laughs> sorry, um, he didn't get here. But yeah, I hope you had a drink anyway. Um, Sony Monkey said, uh, yo, Mr. H, fuck, love your videos on the Alien and Predator lore videos, very entertaining, and I bought the comics, and Drinker, you'll never hear the end of Elden Ring, it's here all year. Well, that's good, because, you know, it'll be a little while before I play it. But yeah, I have watched some of Mr. H's videos about the lore of Aliens, um, and it's really good, actually, he's put a lot of thought into it, so good stuff, it's very well put together. DJ Casey said, Andre, I would love to see Mauler on Midnight's Edge one day. Cheers all. Oh. I'd love to see Mauler on Midnight's Edge one day. You're welcome anytime. Well, hey, I mean, if what, 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 what do you want to talk about? <laughs> like, grab him something I know something about, and I'm game. <clears throat> well, anything you feel like. I mean, we have, like, morning show three times a week, so anything you feel like you're ranting on about, you'd be most welcome. Well, hey, we got Kenobi coming up. I'm pretty sure oh, I'll... Yeah. Perfect. Have an infinite slew of things to complain about when that comes out. <laughs> Perfect. No, it's going to be Make good. What are you talking about? Yeah, Nick, I'll kill you. I need to have you back <laughs> uh, on on uh, on our morning show. Same with you, drink. You're like, uh, you haven't been there for a while uh, either of you. We have to check it and fix that. Yeah, yeah, no, it's been a while. We could double team it, I suppose, at some point. That'd be uh, awesome. Oh my. Yeah. <laughs> It'll be a menage a trois on YouTube live. Uh, uh, like, what is it? May that Kenobi comes out? Is that is that when we're getting it? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm. May. <laughs> so it shall be. Well, okay. We'll see what we can do there. Um, CJ Broskins said, "Afternoon, lads. Can't stay long due to lack of Wi-Fi in my new place. I'm sure Mr. H can sympathise. Um, hoping to get it fixed soon. Party on, guys. You're all awesome. Thanks, man." Um, Jin Korea said, some of my favorite people all together. Cheers, mates. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Robot Dues said, have one on me, fellas. Love the discussions and great analysis and helping me realize I'm not insane for finding new media to be complete trash. Yeah, you're, you're definitely not. Um, mm. Just go watch some 80s movies. You'll, it'll make you feel better. Or, or go all the way back to the 70s exploitation movies and really just enjoy it. Watch like Women in Cages or whatever. Uh, women in hell, they're, oh, they're so fun. Uh, what was it? Black shampoo, black shampoo. You got to watch it. Fantastic movie. Nice, yeah. I mean, this is the thing, yeah. Movies back then were just a lot more fun. I mean, the thing is, we're still producing films like that now, it's just not the mainstream kind of movies that you get. Uh, when, you, you when you're looking for them, yeah, you it's just the hard thing for me is that uh, so while while like tech has gotten accessible to people to make like you can go get a, an 8K camera or whatever for not too much money. If you're going to like in in the terms of budgeting out a film, right, uh, you can get an 8K camera, you can get everything set up, you can record something and it can be well done. But because everything else is lacking, all independent films have that like way too tight a shot all the time because it can't show the backgrounds that they couldn't spend any money on. And uh, and it's it's like dis it's discomforting to me to watch it. Like there's no, uh, they're they're not able to get past that barrier 
for me on on a lot of the indie flicks that I've seen. Yeah, they're kind of claustrophobic, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah, they're yeah. way zoomed in on the people, <laughs> and it produces that uh, they don't have a good. I don't know. Maybe it's a good lighting engineer or whatever. That it, it's they don't look right. They don't look good. And they all look cheap. And I know people can do better. I'm calling on amateur filmmakers. Please do better so you can get past my uncanny valley problems so that I That's can okay. enjoy your work. These uh, these low budget indie flicks will probably have Bruce Willis in them for a cameo. So you'll be all right. <laughs> I can enjoy that. But Nicolas Cage will run the lead role in all of them anyway. So <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, I was watching some some bits from Apex, which is like, yeah, I don't know if you know, but like Bruce Willis is now just making a career out of like doing five minute cameos in movies and picking up like a million dollars a piece for doing it. Um, sweet gig. Oh, man, and it's just, it's some of the laziest performances I've seen from any actor, I think, ever. <laughs> At least with Nick Cage, when he's in a film, it's like, yeah, he's he's there 100%, sometimes mm -hmm. 110% with Nick Cage. Um, he goes full. But with Bruce, he's just like literally, yeah, okay, I'll show up. Um, you're, you're probably going to have to feed me my lines through an earpiece or something because I can't be bothered reading the script. And that's, that's all you get out of him. Actually, there's a reason for that, apparently. I think some stories have come out because, yeah, he is fed lines through, uh, through an earpiece. But apparently it's because he has some kind of mental de degenerative condition, so he's not mentally all there anymore. I've he's... heard this, but then I've also heard it's actually because he's um, he's blind. It's in, not blind. He's deaf in one ear, or at least you know partially deaf in one ear because of uh, the the sort of gunshots that he had to do in Die Hard. Like he was firing a gun really close to his head at, in one scene, uh, and that's what like damaged his eardrum. Yeah, but he has like this in the other ear. And is this is this legit? Like he's I, I don't know if it's legit, I, but uh, yeah, but I, uh, I've heard that from several places now. And when you look at him, yeah, you can see that he's phoning it in, or he does as good as he can for a former actor that's no longer capable of delivering the kind of performance that he once was. Yes, I I don't me. know if it's accurate, but uh, just looking at him. Having heard that, I can kind of see it. There's one here. Uh, where, where, where is it? 2022 Bruce Willis would let 1988 Hans Gruber win. <laughs> 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 I think he would. Uh, but yeah, you have to wonder, like, what's, what's his real motivation for even doing this at this point? Well, that's how we're getting all these answers, I think. Everyone's just, like, speculating because it's so fucking crazy and bizarre. Like, when you watch... I'm assuming a lot of us may have seen the Red Light Media breakdowns of these uh, Bruce Willis movies, but it's just the worst kind of filmmaking, at least in relation to all of his parts. And it's just like, what the hell is going on? <laughs> like, you know, is he super desperate for money? Is that the only way we could explain it? That it's like... Yo, is he also losing his mind? It's like, I don't know. Someone needs yep. to do a, uh, a an entire indie film where they use that cameo app to have actors read a bunch of lines. Like, so they pay him like thirty bucks at a shot or yeah. whatever for cameo <laughs> shout outs, and they're actually just filming a movie where they're like, uh, you know, someone's FaceTiming with uh, Gilbert Gottfried or whatever in a Dude, horror movie. That would be fucking great. There are YouTubers who do that. They they do like a breakdown analysis thing, long form, and they'll say in the title featuring and then this famous person. And the opening will be that famous person really awkwardly being like, hello, everyone, and welcome to Radical Gamers channel. <laughs> uh, we're going to be talking about uh, ah, Elden Ring. <laughs> that is... That is one of the saddest ways of making money. <laughs> no, I, know, I know it 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 works, but like if you're an actor and like that's what you find yourself doing, like you know, doing these little cameo video segments for like thirty dollars a pop, fucking hell! Like, where you what are you doing with your life? You know, I used to be in films. I used to I used actually to act. somebody. Yeah, exactly. You know, I used to I used to set the silver screen on fire with my charisma. Now I'm reduced to this. Talking to people I've never met and don't care about. I hate oh, God, my life. I should do that. I should do set it. up a cameo. Do it. <laughs> do it. You, know, you need workout motivation. I'll fat shame you. There you go. Over cameo. Yeah. No one is desperate <laughs> for Nobody's money. Nobody's making careers off of that shit, man. Like, 
didn't um wasn't it like big man tyrone didn't he like yeah oh, the name right or wrong i don't think i don't know if he started on cameo maybe it was another site fiverr was it uh it's the same thing I, though where you like you pay someone something small and then they do like a performance for you yeah he did one for me he did one about me one of my fans bought one uh, so, yeah, big man Tyrone. There's a Ricardo Law one somewhere. Yeah, it's a fun little service. Rick Flair should do cameos. He really should, actually. I think Jesus is on there as well. Jesus, <laughs> the guy who dresses up as Jesus and just says like, "Hello, my son." Just delivers whatever you, like thing you want. I can I can really lift your day. You know, if Jesus wants me to have a good day, it's like, yeah, I'll, yeah. I'll do my best. Jesus, thanks. <laughs> um, wait, where did I get to here? So, yeah, yeah. Uh, Taylor Ha says, uh, Over the Top was definitely Stallone's best movie. I mean, it was a bold strategy. It's like, yeah, we're just gonna have a movie about an arm wrestling tournament, and he's a truck driver who's got to get to the next tournament to I win. Oh, man, does it, does it really compare to Stop All My Mum Will Shoot? Like, Cinematography-wise, no heavy way. issues. Mm. They really do. Where else are you going to see Stallone in a nappy? Exactly. That was that was uh, yeah. That was bold. That was a bold creative choice. <laughs> you just don't do that no more. You know, it's, it's a sad reality. This is true. Um, Phantom Mercenary says Rambo three teams with the Taliban looks bad in retrospect. That wasn't the Taliban. That was the Mujahideen. <laughs> totally different. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I didn't age well. <laughs> Thomas Thompson says, "Hey Nick, last time you were on, mentioned that Rome is your favorite TV series. Hadn't seen it myself since originally aired, so I went and binge watched both series, and was uh, it was absolutely brilliant. So thanks for the recommendation. You're welcome. You're welcome. You, you made someone's life better there, Nick. Um, At least one. Yes. Is, now I'm done. I'm done. One now of I'm the done. best series ever made. Shame it was uh, cancelled prematurely. Yeah. Fantastic cast. Uh, James Purefoy, by the way, deserves to be in more things. That guy's phenomenal. Check him out in Solomon Kane. Yep. Solomon Kane, also in the uh, first season of Altered Carbon. Oh, wait. Let me correct that. The only season of Altered Carbon. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there was nothing beyond wait, that. Was he in Altered Carbon? Do you mean he was in He was in Expanse, right? Was he in Altered Carbon? Yeah, he was. He was the, the villain. Wow, that's complete. I watched the first season. I'm completely blanking that he was in it. Yeah, he was there full frontal naked as well. You saw his dick and everything. Could have done without that, but yeah. yeah well, he, he you was... saw his dick in Rome too. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, because yes, Varanus right. walks up, walks oh, up yeah, while he's sorry. getting like washed I, off. I know how I fucked up. I mixed it up with Tom Jane. That's my bad. Yeah, uh, you're not the only one. So yeah, that's fair. That is weird. Now that you mention it, actually, they they do sort of merge together into some strange entity if you look at the two of them <laughs> next to each other it's like uh, will federal and the drummer in uh, in um in, in, uh, <laughs> uh, Tom Hutchel, James uh, Hutchel, Hutchel, going which, for, yeah yeah <laughs> they look just alike yeah there's definitely a connection there uh canon folderall says drinker a great interview with neil marshall the other day mingling with actors directors could it be the drinkers gone hollywood <laughs> never <laughs> The, the Hollywood drinker. Uh, no, this is just, um, you know, one of these conversations leads to another and like, uh, oh, it's like, you know, this person, would they like to come on and do this uh, this interview? Yeah, sure. And that's where it goes. But yeah, it's fun. Um, like I say, it gives you a great perspective because it's easy for, you know, people like us to sit here and say, this movie sucks. It's the director's fault because they, they did a bad job. And then you hear about things like, what it was like trying to make Hellboy, um, mm. and you know, it's like ninety percent the studio just dictating everything that happens, and the director's just basically there to yell action, um, and they don't they don't get to like really bring their own vision to life, and so it sucks. And so by yeah, the, that, things like that are useful to understand how these things actually go down. By the same token, we never actually know when the studio could be appreciated. You know, I don't think that's ever has anyone ever said like, thank goodness <laughs> the studio made the decision to bubble. You know, this is like we never it must know. Yeah, it must have happened. It has happened yeah. many times. Well, of averages. Actually. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, they point. did it. Uh, <laughs> so um, two movies that I love. I found out that this this basically happened. Uh, Showdown in Little Tokyo and uh, Out for Justice. 
um, Brandon Lee and Dolph Lundgren and showed on little Tokyo, Steven Seagal out for justice. Uh, the studio in both of in, in out for justice had a mess of a film and they're like, Nope, we need to hire this guy. And they hired some editor who came in, just chopped it up. I mean, he just mangled the film and made it into the beautiful thing that it ended up being, which I love that movie. And then showdown in little Tokyo was a meandering, slow moving mess. And this guy cuts it down to 78 minutes. It's the same guy. Uh, the studio hired the same guy and they're like, Whoa, look what he did for out for justice. And they, they brought him in. So, I mean, they do. They do uh, on occasion. <laughs> like, no. I have another one like that. One that you wouldn't even um, uh, even know. Going back to Rambo, First Blood. The first, the original cut of First Blood was mm. some slow, meandering, three-hour-long drama, and it wasn't working. I mean, S S Stallone, he was worried that that slow and boring movie was going to destroy his career. And then some executive said, "What? What if we cut it down?" What if we cut this slow drop down to like a short actor and they got an editor to come in and cut it down to a 90 minute movie? So that's didn't the original today. Didn't the original cut have Rambo getting killed as well at the end? So uh, you wouldn't have even had no, a franchise. That was, never, that was never in the movie. It, uh, it well, was, it was definitely filmed because I've seen it. Um, it. It was it was filmed, but it was never meant to be released. Uh, okay. There was, there was never a cut with uh, with uh, with Rambo uh, dying that was ever planned to be released. They filmed the scene so that they would have the option, but they but there was never any serious plan of ever using it. That is uh, that is why Kirk Douglas stepped down from the role of Troutman because he was insistent on you no know, Rambo has to die in the end, and the producers were adamant that no he uh, he uh, he has to live. And then was like, mm. that was the that was the really important part of the book. So if you're not doing that, I'm out. And uh, then they got Rich Krenner to replace him. So it worked out fine. But uh, there was never any serious intention of having Rambo die in the movie. Okay. I heard uh, I heard Pulp Fiction was actually recut because um, after they filmed it, they filmed it chronologically, and then some guys like they were like, no isn't working and so they recut it into what it is and and of course that was the right decision that's what i heard from a guy uh who who did a lot of he did that for tv so uh who I don't know. is this guy can we sydney trust this i want guy? his I... name is sydney i want oh and uh what he's the guy I... <laughs> he was the uh he would do like script approval for a lot of the 80s family television programming um from like my little pony transformers on up to uh you know like full house and stuff like that uh that mm -hmm. was that was his job uh he came and spoke to our screenwriting class back when i was in college because my professor knew him somehow no uh, i i know um because <clears throat> I, I read like a biography of i think tarantino and talking about this movie and um they had a really hard time selling the concept to the the studio executives because it was like uh, they were really pissed off that john travolta gets killed in it like halfway through and like, you know, Tarantino was trying to explain, well, yeah, but like the way the movie's structured is that like you jump back in time. And so for the final, um, you know, segment, he's alive again because he's, you know, the, you've gone back in time a little bit and it's like the, the restaurant uh, robbery scene. Uh, and they just couldn't wrap their heads around like, well, how's that going to work? Like he, he's dead, then he's alive again. The audience aren't going to understand it. And like Tarantino was trying to explain to them, yeah, they mm. will because we're going to, we're going to cut it in the right way so that it'll make sense when it's on screen. And it took a hell of a lot of persuasion to get them bought into that because they just couldn't see how you could do a non-chronological movie like that. But yeah, thank God he did do it that way. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> he would have, if you lay it out chronologically, it's, it's not as exciting of a movie. No. Uh, yeah, there we go. The Sellout Drinker, sponsored by Disney. I don't know what you're saying. Disney is fantastic. They they know exactly what we need, and they're happy to give it to us. So don't question them. Um, the, uh, Taylor has uh, Demolition Man and Tango and Cash are incredible movies. Um, I'm not going to argue. They're both good fun. Uh, I need to do a review of Tango and Cash, actually. That is a good one. God, that movie's uh, great. Stephen Bobo says, I have a question for Rikita Law, but whole panel Ooh. can join in. What movie or TV show is very accurate with how Court of Laws is portrayed in real life? 
Uh, My Cousin Vinny is the best courtroom movie that exists. Unironically. Wow. Um, I mean, obviously, he's not a li- he's not yet a licensed a- attorney, uh, and and he does a lot of stuff wrong. But what they do in the movie, like the actual procedure, is my I mean, my rules of evidence class was taught by a uh, former judge, and I mean, he used my cousin Vinny as a teaching aid because of how they did the scenes in the movie. They're done correctly, so there you go, my cousin. Not Vinny. legal, not legally blonde then. No. <laughs> what about um? <laughs> What about a few good men? Damn it! Uh, few good men is under the Uniform Code of Military Justice, um, and I've, I haven't seen it in a. I have not seen it since becoming a lawyer, so I I couldn't tell you, but I'm going to say no. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if most movies that involve the law are pretty inaccurate. Well, yeah, if you think... if you sit around on my channel and watch some of the courtroom, like uh, the live streams that we do, that are nine hours and literally nothing happens for an entire day, uh, except for like boring sidebars uh, where where the lawyers are arguing with the judge over something, um, you'll realize that basically no movie nails a courtroom because everybody in the audience would want to kill themselves. I, I was going to say like the the thing that movies really build up right is the idea that lawyers are these incredible wordsmiths that are capable of bringing together like inc- you know brilliant speeches that really stir the heart and absolutely get you bought into to the case that they're trying to make. Uh, and then when you see it in real life, they're really slow and halting, and they stumble and they repeat themselves, and it's just really tedious. And yes. you think, God oh, damn, man, you're getting paid like, you know, a thousand dollars a minute for doing this shit. You could at least compose a good like closing <laughs> argument. And most of the, the time they cannot. The, uh, yeah, the, the one that always stuck with me was the OJ Simpson trial, because yeah. the, the defense for that is so fucking compelling. You know, it's absolute garbage what they're they're trying to sell you. But mm-hmm. they frame it so well. It's like, damn, I believe you now. And I know it's wrong. <laughs> like. They're so good at it. Did you um? Did you guys see the the People versus OJ Simpson the crime drama yes. thing on Netflix? I was, I was quite really good. That. Yeah. yeah, I didn't watch it. Really liked it. I should well, um, learned uh, a lot about. Well, assuming it's honest, I learned a lot about uh, how people's lives get ruined just by being a part of these cases. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, the uh, yeah OJ Johnny Cochran's argument and OJ Simpson was so good that uh, this lawyer named B. Ivory Lamar literally stole the opening statement for his defense of a guy named Theodore Edgecombe. Um, Theodore Edgecombe got, uh, got prison though. He didn't make it. He didn't, he he wasn't let go, (laughs) but he he plagiarized the opening. It was great. There's a lot of great things that um, get raised in the course of that, um, that TV show. One of them being the, the whole thing about the glove not fitting which obviously yeah. was a cornerstone of the defense case. But then you've got like irrefutable scientific evidence from like the, the prosecution saying like, look, we've got DA, DNA evidence that puts him at the scene. Like it's proven to within like a, a billionth of 1% accuracy. Um, and, it's all about casting that doubt, isn't it? Yeah, well, there, there's one point where the one of the senior do, uh, sort of prosecutors, because they can see that their, their case is starting to fall apart. And he just <laughs> yells like, People don't understand DNA. They don't understand the science behind this, but they understand when a glove doesn't fucking fit on someone's hand. Yeah. And that was just like a perfect encapsulation of the entire case. It's like when you're relying on just really dry science and you don't present it in the right way, like people just don't get it. They don't understand it, but they understand narrative that plays Mm -hmm. to your emotions. And that's what won the case for them. And I just think that's brilliant. It's such an interesting insight into how people think. I don't know if it was true as well, but uh, it was fascinating that they like bait the idea that they wouldn't want them to bring out the glove because it'll be it'll screw them over. But then the the defense team wanted the glove out because they knew it wouldn't yeah. fit. If that's true, if that's how it happened in real life, that's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> but I yeah, have a feeling really knew it might how be to Hollywood manipulate video. that guy, didn't he, Cochran? Have, have no idea. But Johnny Johnny Cochran's the legend, man. I mean, if you can if you can get OJ off of that murder, then then you you deserve every billion dollar that you're worth. Yeah. Did you um because uh, Drink, you said you watched it. I thought that the casting throughout it was uh, exceptional, except for OJ. Cuba. 
Yeah. yeah, Cuba Gooding Jr. It was a fucking weird choice. Like he doesn't look or talk anything like OJ. Yeah, um, and it, it's fine because in a sense, like he's not even that important. Like he's kind of just in the background most of the time, and even the sh- the show plays it fairly like conservative. They it doesn't really make it doesn't really make a, a choice about what he did or or didn't do. It's just like it's all about the le- the legal battle around yes. him. They try to avo- um, they even avoid having him admit anything, even in the private conversations, because I think they didn't want to take side. But with how the show ends, do you remember how the show ends? Yeah, I quite liked it. I thought it was the the show's way of being like, yeah, he was proven innocent. <laughs> and he will likely he lost a lot of friendships, and he's gonna be happy sitting in his house alone with all that money, being innocent. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the show was like, also he went to jail years later. <laughs> <laughs> it's such a shame because that series had such potential, but then it followed it up with like the I think it was the assassination of Versace. No. Was it Versace? Um it was the next one, and yeah, hold on. Because uh, I watched about half of it, and I was just absolutely turned off by it. It was so fucking tedious. Uh, story. It's like Serial, yeah. the podcast Serial. The first season of Serial was was amazing, uh, very good, and uh, yeah, covered the murder trial, and then the, yeah, the the, so yeah, up. the oh, go ahead. season two was the assassination of Gianni Versace, uh, and it was just so fucking tedious um it, mm. it was all about the the murderer and like the, the the affairs and the the lies and stuff that he told leading up to it it was just it didn't grab me at all but then i think the most recent one was about the lewinsky clinton scandal which is a bit more interesting because it's like something i could actually remember from being a kid um and yeah, that was that was kind of a bit better the OJ one, I was like, how are you going to get this many episodes out of this? And then I ended up watching the whole thing like, all right, well, that was fun. <laughs> you had lots of things to talk about. Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty compelling stuff. Um, and it's just, it's fascinating that you can take what should have been a slam dunk case and just slowly unravel it and, and turn it yeah, into when, a, a victory. Because in the beginning of the story, they're like, this will be easy. Uh, and they've got yeah. all their evidence ready. And then just piece by piece, they're torn away one by one as they get like discredited. The big part being that the cop that was primarily involved, <laughs> Mark is... Furman, yeah, <laughs> it's like he's, yeah, he's got uh, he's got like Nazi memorabilia in his apartment. <laughs> like, I just damn. like it, okay? <laughs> yeah, it's like I just like to collect medals. You know what can I say? They're all German medals from World War II, but you know that's how it shakes out. <laughs> Got unlucky with the ones I found. What? Yeah, <laughs> they were on sale. Okay. <laughs> um, Michael Sessi says, "Drinker, what are your thoughts on the TV series Justified?" Also, Nick, give us unbreaded. <laughs> I don't. I don't know if I. I don't tend to do unbreaded on other people's channels because, um, you know, it's a little bit, a little bit edgy. Is it? Is it sexual? No, uh, un- unbreaded. So this uh, UCLA philosophy professor um, wrote an 803-page manifesto, and uh, it has lots yeah. of gamer words in it. Uh, Dude, that's longer than my TFA series. Oh, God. Only it's, just. It, <laughs> it's, it's so funny. And way more N-words. <laughs> yeah. 10,386 N-words in it. So Wow, in an 800-page document. That's, uh, that's some heavy usage. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, <laughs> it, it's a it's a high rate of use, uh, but it's it's great. Uh, I read I read a page of it every night on my live stream, but I I don't tend to read it on other people's paid uh, live streams because, uh, like I said, it it's got some racy stuff in it. How far uh, are you okay. now then? Uh, that, that... I do I use a randomizer, uh, so we we just take one page out of context every time. <laughs> it's, it's more fun that way. Uh, but, uh, I think we've done like 20 of them somewhere, somewhere on there. Nice. Uh, it, it sounds like, uh, sounds like a real blast reading a page of that stuff every, every few days. Uh, it's funny every single time. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't know how to the insanity. It. Yeah. Uh, well, the problem is just... the guy is so close to, uh, making really good points 
and then he'll go off in like the most horrifically racist rants. <laughs> it's like, this is beautiful. Uh, he's black, by the way, so he gets the N word pass. Oh, okay. oh, yeah, yeah, it's fine yeah. When, when he does it. Uh, yep. But yeah, as for Justified, um, I, I haven't watched it myself. Uh, I was looking it up there. So it's got Timothy Olyphant in it as like mm. a, a marshal that's dispensing his own brand of justice. I do like Timothy Olyphant, to be fair. People always uh, reference he's... that character whenever he pops up in Mandalorian, that they essentially just plucked him from that and dropped him into <laughs> Plant Mandalorian. Cause there was, you know, that's how they do yeah. it. It's like, hey, you like this? Look at this. Look, look at him go. <laughs> and it's funny because they, you know, people, and, and I've fallen into this trap as well. It's like, oh, like, I really like that character in Mandalorian. And is it because he's a good character or is it just because, like, he looks cool and Timothy Olyphant's a good actor? <laughs> I mean, I think that might be all it is. <laughs> he, uh, he carried Die Hard 4. Uh, bro, 4.0. All right. <laughs> yeah. Because the tech movie. That's true. Uh, I actually really liked Timothy Oliphant in The Girl Next Door, uh, which is a great movie. Great movie. I don't know if anybody's seen that. Other Girl than Next Door. Is that like a no. romance thing? Uh, or? Girl Next Door, uh, half a romance. Uh, Timothy Oliphant's a porn producer. And uh, what's the chick's name? Elijah Cuthbert, maybe? Oh, yeah. Hmm. Uh, she she's in it. Elijah. No, no, that's Elijah Dushku. Oh yeah. Uh, what's here? Is this? Is that her name? Yeah, Elijah Cuthbert, uh, and Emil Hirsch. It's about a high school student, and the the girl who lives next door to him is a porn actress. Timothy Oliphant is her uh, producer, um, but he he of course like he falls in love with her or whatever. But uh, lots of adventure and action and funny stuff. It's it's a good flick. I don't know how to describe it. It's a good movie though. Hmm. Uh, also, she's uh, stunning. Yeah, she was in Twenty Four, wasn't she? Yeah, Cuthbert. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I remember that. There's a few scenes of her in a vest. Perfect. Um, Midnight's Edge after dark. That sounds familiar. He says, "Hey, I know these guys. <laughs> you doing that?" Well, um, yeah, that would be my associate Tom, who's uh, out there um, blocking away at the next video that will be releasing tomorrow. On uh, Disney's um, Disney's troubles in Florida, or with Florida re legislation, rather. So do check that oh, out. Yeah. That'll be great fun. Yeah, that was a that was a fun debacle, wasn't it? It's oh, like yeah, we're we're not going to get involved in this because we're just an entertainment company. And then yeah, all the Alphabet people in Disney are like, ah, you have to talk, you have to make a ruling on this, you have to be political. And then yeah, yeah before like you cool know thing. it, they bent the knee. Yeah. Yeah, but that's like the whole thing, that uh, JPEG has been taking the whole company in a decidedly non-political direction. Now, of course, you don't see it right away, but they notice it behind the scenes. Because what he's been doing is that he has systematically been removing power from all of the ideological crazies. And so they're fighting back. That's what we're seeing right now. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's. Well, it's an interesting battle to play out. I, I just feel like Chapek's days are numbered. You know, he's inheriting a sinking know. ship at I don't the moment. Know. Well, that he had, well, here's the thing: what he inherited was the Titanic after the captain, the former captain Bob Iger, had steered it straight at the iceberg, and he has like a, a short little time interval to try to change course and uh, if you can't change the course then try to hit it in such a way so that the ship doesn't quite sink that's what he's doing but then he has all the people still there that wants the ship to sink that care nothing for disney's profit only activism and of course they want him gone they want Iger back or someone like Iger, another idealist or another activist uh, but uh, as long as uh, the majority of the shareholders are with JPEG, he's not going anywhere. And I think so they... far, the, the shareholders have been behind him because he's been doing a fairly good job at maintaining the shareholder value better than anyone would expect, really. I, I think the problem with a guy like that is he's really unpopular in the theme park world because like, his strategy now is to basically offer less but charge more 
you know, taking away little services and, and you know, just bumping up the prices of everything. Being um, part of is he's... not as, uh, he's not going to win any popularity contest that way, but he's been doing some good stuff. If you're a consumer, he's been doing some good stuff on the entertainment side of things. Yeah, I think I with entertainment, with that's... The parks. Yeah, I, I think that's, I guess that's the problem. It's like he's a, you know, he's a double-edged sword, really. On the one hand, he, he's going to, I guess, try and cut politics and pandering stuff out of the entertainment side of things and just make something that appeals to the, the mass market again. Um, yeah, the, the flip like side of that, he... though, is that he's going to wring as much money out of the parks as he can, and so he's yeah. going to like cut costs wherever he possible. Is, he is there to increase value for the shareholders, and he has no loyalty to which way that is done. But what the numbers say is that uh, if you go woke, you go broke. The numbers say that. So he's trying to roll that back a little bit. Not for any ideological purpose, but only because that's a way to increase shareholder value. But of course, then he made some significant resistance in, in doing that. So we'll see how it all plays out. But as long as he has the board with him, he's, uh, he's going to get this one year because he's just contracted until next year. So he has to, that to make it work. So unless suddenly major investors suddenly have gotten cold feet, and I would hope that they don't, because if they do, they can kiss their investments in Disney goodbye, because the company is going down the drain if they get someone like Iger running the show again, if they get someone that's going to give in to the activists more than already has been done. It feels like the company's just... I don't know, man. It's like too heavily infiltrated by all these people. Like at every level, you know, the only way to sort it would be to do a wholesale, a wholesale kind of clearing of house. Yes, fire everyone, which you can't do. Like legally, even if you, even if you wanted to, you legally couldn't do it. You can't just fire people because they're too ideological. Exactly. To, so what you can do case. though, what you can do though, is that you can put in more bureaucracy to stop them, put in checks and balances, which is exactly what he's done. Or ignore them entirely, because the uh, the the thing is, and th this is what baffles me about Disney, is Disney is a brand like Marvel or DC, and it, it baffles me about them too. People grow up dreaming to work on the thing that they love, right? So they're like, oh, I want to be a comic book artist. I want to work on Disney animated films. And they, they'll they do their whole thing. And then they'll get in there and then they'll, they'll bitch and bitch and bitch about whatever stupid uh, issue they have, right? Whatever, whatever nom de plume is that, that's not the right term. It doesn't matter. Whatever thing they have, uh, they'll be complaining about it. And, and Disney needs to just remember that it's Disney and those people want to be at Disney. And they have no right to change the quote unquote culture at Disney or anything like that because they're all there because they dreamed and desired to be there. Nobody ends up at Disney. It's not like Arby's, right? Like, wow, well, actually, I that's the problem that you that Iger in particular he recruited loads of people that just ended up being there that had no desire to ever be there. You're thinking of the people that are stopping the parks. Oh, yeah, they had a lifelong dream and everything. But the, but the heads of the various divisions and stuff like that, they never had a dream of working for right. Disney. On the contrary, many of the people working at Disney right now at very high levels are, in a sense, ashamed of working for Disney. They think that Walt Disney himself was a problematic man with a problematic legacy that they are trying to make better by by now being on the right side of history, which is something that the accursed creator of the company wasn't. That's the mindset of too many people in Disney right now. But as the walkouts showed uh, in the just here two days ago, when they had like a whooping one person walking out in, in <laughs> Florida and in L.A., some reports said it was like 22. Other reports say may have been up to 60, 70, but they only walked around the building once. And some publications used like oh, pictures of past demonstrations from other events altogether because the ones from, from this Disney thing was just too embarrassing. What mm -hmm. it goes to show is that it's a very organized cult that has gotten root within Disney. 
but there may be not that rumorous, numerous, they're not as numerous as you may think. So uh, you can't outright fire them for being for being not cases. Try to limit well, they, their power and then wait till they screw up. Well, I was going to say they seem to wield them. an enormous amount of power and influence over the company. Like there was, a, yeah, there was an interesting letter, like an open letter that was penned by, like I guess, the conservative element of Disney. I guess such a thing does exist, hmm. and they were just straight up saying, "Look, we're not." we're not calling for the company to um, push conservative values or anything. We would just rather they stayed out of politics altogether and just made universal entertainment that, that everyone can enjoy. And it's especially important when we're living in a really polarized time. Um, and that's their only demand. Whereas the, they were pointing out like the people on the opposite side who are these like super progressive, like hardcore lefty types, they demand absolute obedience to like their ideology. They demand that the company push everything that they believe. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the difference. Like they want the company to be as political as it possibly can be. But nobody else wants that. The consumers don't you, want that. There's no such thing as a non-political piece of media. That's what they would tell you. And you'd be like, um, yeah, it's that right. whole, yeah. that whole all art is political. Yeah. The we, problem with with mm -hmm. such cultists is that they exist only in in uh, two different states. One is a state of victimhood, where they want power, where they want representation, and the other is the state of oppressor, where they have it, mm -hmm. and then they will oppress everyone else. Like you have no idea. But then they're they're very difficult to get rid of because, like you say, if they they adopt the oppressed mindset, you know, if you try and manage them out the door or fire them or whatever they'll just scream that they've been victimized because they are just standing up for what's right and they're just trying to stand with all the the good things in the world and this yeah, evil the corporation right is trying to ruin them how could you be opposed how could anyone be opposed to this thing that we stand for yeah and and this this is uh I don't know, man. It's like the conundrum of our time. It's how do you how do you neutralize people like that and get them the fuck out of your company without destroying the company in the process? Yeah, that's the challenge facing Chapek. They're they're like a fucking face hugger attached to the <laughs> the the company of Disney. Like you can't kill you can't take them off without killing the host. They're cancer with spread. They a malignant blood cancer. That's spread. that's exactly what it is. Yeah, they'll bleed acid blood all over social media. And uh, and kill your company that way. So one way or another, they'll ruin you. Like Frost. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, God. <laughs> Is she How's fired? How's D4 getting on these days? <laughs> I, I think they fired her, right? I don't I'm think sure they fired done, her. No, they've probably done some shuffling of some kind. Probably being like, hey, maybe uh, less social media posts. Just, just for now. I just, I, I love the fact that she goes on this like what she sees as a beautiful rant about sexism and gaming and objectifying women and stuff and then like a month later they got amaranth in a bikini in a fucking ball pit oh, just God. frolicking around on their so show <laughs> it's like what are you doing yeah i mean i don't i'm not complaining about it's it funny. but like that's that's what it used to be a like on g4 but it's just hilarious though, Laurie, because this is parody levels. You, this is a sketch in some show, but no, it's just real. You'd yep. have her say all that shit, and then be like, "Next, you know, coming up next, a great point, Frost. Next week, Amaranth is going to be teaching us about, you know, hot tub streaming." And then Frost yeah, is like smiling uh... while they do this ad, like. <laughs> Yeah, God, it's it, it's such a disaster, and you could you could see G four going. Wait, I forgot our our target our target audience was fifteen to forty five or fifteen to thirty five males. Shit, <laughs> we and we hired a complete moron to come on here and tell them all that they're horrible people. Uh, I know. Uh, uh, put it put a chick in a bikini. Make sure she has big cans too. It'll be perfect. We'll see. I'm sure Frost would say like, well, no people people tune into Amaranth for um you know philosophical discussions. Or, uh, yeah. Ruminations upon the existence of. Well, I remember her essay entitled. 
<laughs> yeah, is I think Amaranth is pretty like straight up about what she does she and has to why be. people watch her. Like she knows exactly what she's about and she's under no illusions. And fair yeah, enough. Playboy and she well, and she would have no their, shame about uh, it, presumably. She doesn't need to. She's Playboy's ambassador for their uh their OnlyFans competitor. Uh they hired they hired Amaranth as their their lead on it. Smart move, by the way. Yeah. Well, there was, there, I'm pretty sure there was a time where she would do like Twitch discussions and stuff on different topics that were leading stuff, but she's just skyrocketed off. I think it was seriously. I think it was the hot tub meta that like she went from 50 50 doing this that the other, but just put it on the horse mask and just making them suck sounds. That's uh, that's where the real money's <laughs> at, guys. <laughs> now she's selling her bathwater. If I was <laughs> living the dream. Yeah. If I was a hot twenty-year-old chick, I'd be licking every microphone I could fucking find. I mean, um, <laughs> why, the, the, why wouldn't you? She, she will be making, money. yeah, she'll be making embarrassing amounts of money. Like she'd put all four of us to shame easily. In, in it's a million a and month. a half a month. That that's the conservative number that she gave yeah, a just, while back. Do do that for a couple of years. You're set for fucking life. Just retire, kick back, do whatever you want. And she doesn't even Easy. have to put anything in her butt. No, <laughs> she's just she's just literally licking a microphone in a bra. Like there are chicks who do way. Uh, I know the uh, I I've talked to the guy who um owns Ghetto Gaggers, right? <laughs> and I asked, him, <laughs> Wow, how much do you pay, how much do you guys pay these chicks? It's like <laughs> the, the amount is really low. <laughs> it's like Jesus Christ! Imagine selling your dignity for like fifteen hundred bucks. <laughs> oh my God. Speaking uh. of which, <laughs> no, 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 no. Truly, everything has a price. Uh, all right, what's what's my next one? I'll do a couple more and then I'll finish up because I don't think I'll get through the, all of them tonight. Uh, John Snowart says, "Have you guys seen the Jack Reacher TV show? Really loving it. Just solid action hero TV show with surprisingly good cinematography. I think we did talk about that a little bit earlier, but yeah, um, yeah I like it. I'm liking it so far." The actor's good, um, yeah, well shot, and um, yeah, it's pretty pretty engaging stuff. I like it. It's great. Um, Ezekiel Jones says thoughts on the Halo TV show. It's getting oh, yes, great. I it's know, getting right? slated, I think, by the critics. They don't like it at all. I, I was, but I thought for a second that you were going to say it looks great. I was like, dude, I've only heard bad things. <laughs> no. I've only heard bad things. I, I, I was I was fifty fifty on the trailer because you know it didn't give a huge amount away, but um, yeah, I've I've heard the critics aren't liking it, so I've no idea. That probably means it's good. To be fair, like yeah, but I've heard the fans are absolutely hating it. Like, I, yeah, that's why I, I don't know how. Uh, okay, myself, but according to people I know who are fans of the games. They've seen a pilot and they absolutely hate it. Well, we're okay. off for another one then, lads. Yeah. So yeah, uh, add, add another add one to the, to the list. The yeah. Burning pile of fucking dead IPs. Just throw <laughs> it on. Well, I think the 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 protagonist in the Halo show is a chick who develops magical powers. I mean, oh on, boy. Like, and I, from what I've heard, that's not a joke. <laughs> like, that's the actual show. It's like, wait, what is what does this have to do with Halo? Uh, yeah, where's John Halo? Where's he jumping around doing his thing? <laughs> <laughs> uh, here's a question for all of us. Um, from Fallout Your Mum says, how would you suggest creatives navigate around constrictive producers? I'm someone who hopes to direct their own movie someday and I would, could use some tips. So, fuck. I mean, I don't know if that's like in our wheelhouse since none of us have actually directed a movie yet, but... Um, I, I think you'd have to be more careful about the projects you took on because once you're locked in contractually, mm. it's not even up to you, really. You know, it's up to the studio yeah. how much creative control they want to exercise over it. That's all I ever seem to find out. Like at one point, I think I mean, everyone thinks of the director as just the guy who's in complete control. But the more you find out about it, the more a director is more a balancing act, a juggler of just everything, trying to please everybody, keep everything Pro flowing. Some project manager. Yeah. Yeah. See, I, I assumed that was what the producer was. Like they were there to handle the you know, the organization of everything, funding, you know, locations and all that, and the director's just there to actually shoot the footage. Depends then, on the production though, because yeah, sometimes it, it is like that. Yeah. So it, it's, uh, it's it would depend. Yeah, and it, it kind of depends on yeah, how big the studio is and like how much of a system they've got set up for this kind of stuff. 
Um, I imagine some are a bit more, um, you know, liberal than others, and some are completely restrictive on what you can do. Yeah, I mean, um, I think your, I think your, the your producer matters a lot too, because as as the director, it, and depending depending on who's managing the project, if you're managing the project because it's a small uh, independent production and you have secured that funding from the producer, then you probably have uh, developed at least a <laughs> salesman relationship with the producer where you've sold them on the idea that you can manage the project without their brilliant input. Um, but if you're in a, I mean, if you're in a studio, you know, if you're associated with a studio and they've secured the funding, I mean, you're at the mercy of the studio. If they come down oh. and say, look, this person uh, has the say, then not much you can do. I like this strategy. Kubrick, uh, Stanley Kubrick made himself his own producer for a reason. And Nolan married his producer. <laughs> uh, well, Good strategy. You got the Mila Jovovich, Paul Lewis Anderson strategy too, where you get lead actress and director money in one package. Yeah, oh, that's weird. And let's not forget Luc Besson because she was married to him before Paul Anderson. Uh, she married him uh, in conjunction with The Fifth Element. I was going to say she married up, but uh, no, not so much. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. Uh, I'll they do one. Masterpiece movies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, what was it? The Three Musketeers we watched. I together. loved it. <laughs> Where's Wait, the uh, sequel, Draco? Where is it? I know. <laughs> the one with Oliver Platt and stuff and uh, no, Kiefer it's, Sutherland? It's the one with, who the fuck was in that movie? I forget now. It was, it was Ray Orlando Stevenson. Bloom. He was one of them. And uh, and he, he was always uh, also in The Hobbit, Mila Jovovich, obviously. And mm. Mats Mikkelsen, he was also in it. He was like he was. Count Richard. Yeah. Which he seems like a good some cast, weird right? things. It's just the director, I guess, at that point. But, yeah. This is a Three Musketeers movie that you're it describing is. right yeah, now? Yeah. Dude, fucking... Okay. Ugh, what's his name is in it? 2011 or something like that. It actually had like a pretty decent 3D post conversion as well. Like the intro sequence. Uh, it's an animated intro. And that was actually really cool in 3D. Too bad the rest of the movie couldn't live up to it. Hmm. I mean, this yes. is this is the Three Musketeers movies where you have like uh, airships and everything like that. So then it like went and a little they, bit overboard. We, we're not talking zeppelins here. We're talking literal fucking like sailing ships that are somehow flying through the air. And and they bait a sequel so hard. He wanted a franchise, but they didn't give it to him. Cruel. Wow. It's like so Monster cool. Hunter. I'm sure, that's that's. Is that getting a sequel? Or are they ignoring no, it? I think they well, they clearly desperately wanted one because it's well open at the end, but um it does no it with way. everything. Yeah, Do you remember the but... ending of the penultimate Resident Evil movie? It was the a horde of demons were surrounding the White House as they all all the main characters are the, the rooftop with guns ready to fight them. That was the ending of that movie. Yeah, and then the next one is just like Fuck it. The battle's over <laughs> and Mila Jovovich is the only one alive. It's like, oh wow, what a crazy battle that was. Anyway, yeah. on to the next adventure. Jeez. <laughs> that was so satisfying. He must have been stressed out about releasing that because that's such a you know, the movies are shit, but <laughs> there are people out there who are probably looking forward to seeing what happened, you know. I, I just I, I honestly think they were continually amazed that they kept getting more movies. I think so, yeah. You know, every time they did it, they thought, oh, this is the last one. Fuck it. We'll just go all in and just throw whatever at it. And then it's like, oh, wait, this made a bit of money. And people want like another the... one. Uh, fuck, what do we do now? Was it a foreign market or was it domestic where people loved Resident Evil movies? Because I don't even know. I didn't check. Wait a minute. Hold on. Uh, how can I do this? Um, so I'm surprised they didn't just keep going, to be honest. There were also some significant them. German tax breaks in there. Hmm. I'll see if there's some kind of weird like summary that will give me all of them. Uh, right, the Resident Evil film series. So, uh, where's the box office here? Okay, yeah, so on average, oh, I don't know, they're probably around 40 to 50 million domestic, and then other territories, yeah, like they're way up at like 200 million, 280 million internationally. Damn. So, yeah, the, the, by far and away, the, the bulk of their, their revenue is international. Like, Resident, Resident Evil, the final chapter, it made 26 million domestic and 287 million internationally. 
Jeez. What the hell is wrong with the world? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it'll probably be like in outer Mongolia and fucking Chad and stuff, like just random places. <laughs> We've never had a movie just before. Desperate for the next installment. It's the greatest storytelling they've ever come across. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I must know what happens next. It's like in Tropic Thunder where they're in like Vietnam and like Simple Jack is like the biggest movie yeah. of all time there. <laughs> it's like no one else cares. <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll do one more here from Stephen Bobo says, uh, random simple weird question for the whole panel. Has anybody seen the British cartoon series Danger Mouse? I have because I like, grew up it. with it because I'm yeah. old. Well, I've seen it. Then. Have you seen it? Yeah. Well, I in have. Norway. Uh, yeah, but not on Norwegian TV for a little while there. Due to some cosmic imbalance, we had the children's channel. And like this, literally the exact same children channel TCC as you had over in the UK, and uh, they had Danger Mouse, and I saw it there. Nice. Yeah. Well, there you go. Yeah, he was uh, he was a secret agent mouse, and he had an eye patch, and he was really cool, and he had a flying car, from what I remember as well. Mm-hmm. And like this little mole friend or sidekick or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, what was it Pen something Penworth or something? Hold on. I, I don't recall the name, but I... I will uh, tell you in a second. Just to, just no, to I find it. Drinker shall find the answer. So, 1981 TV series, yeah. So, there was... Penfold, yeah. Penfold, that was it. There you go. Yeah, I knew it was something. It's coming back to me. Hazy childhood memories. Oh. <coughs> Holy uh, shit, everyone in chat knew that. You all watched Danger Mouse, huh? <laughs> Damn. I, hope, anyway. I don't Danger think Mouse, I man. did. All right, Nick, you can leave. Oh, yeah, it's, it's cool. <laughs> uh, I'll make this the last one, actually, uh, from Stybeck B. He said, thanks for recommending Extraction. All that single-shot action scenes are great. Um, so I oh, later yeah. watched Hardcore Henry, the most unique action movie in history. Yeah, it's a single-take movie. Well, kind of, anyway. But yeah, it's like a um, person shooter type thing. Yeah, the Extraction and action scenes were fucking awesome. And like storyline is pretty simple. So pretty normal, but I'd be up for watching whatever they do with a sequel, but I do worry, you know. Sequelitis yeah. can get into everything. I, I think so. But yeah, I enjoyed it. Um, I, I said this before, there's a lot to be said for just a, a really simple concept that's just well done, and I think the extraction mm -hmm. is good proof of that. That's all you need in an action movie. Uh, just a great action scenes, lots of, lots of killing, lots of explosions, um, and just a pretty simple plot to tie it together. Easy. I liked it a lot, um, and it proves, yeah, Hemsworth can do do these kind of action films. Great, good stuff. Uh, but yeah, I think I probably like I'll, I'll finish up with the super chats there. Like, there's more I'll do on the catch up stream in a few days. But um, yeah, man, I'll, uh, that's probably enough for tonight because I've kept you guys here for quite a while. Um, but yeah, thanks, thanks to all you guys for coming in for this. It's very much appreciated. Um, yeah, I guess this is your chance like, to let us know what you've got coming up. Is there anything that you guys want to make the chat aware of um, that you got that you're going to be producing soon? Uh, I'll let either of you either <laughs> go ahead. Or Andre, Who goes so. first? Who goes yeah. first? I'll, I'll I, I put can, it open uh, to the panel. Yeah, I can I can go first then, uh, since I'm so unshy. Um, we recently, like uh, only yesterday or something, we put out. Um, uh, a retrospective on the 1987 Masters of the Universe, and uh, this is, quite honestly, the single most extensive retrospective on that movie ever made. You won't find anything with as much information as, as that one. Uh, unfortunately, uh, YouTube really has it in for Midnight Edge these days, so most of our subscribers don't get notifications, so... Uh, very few are aware of it. So if you want some stories on that uh, on that movie, a bunch of cool trivia, go check that video out. Subscribe. Uh, next video we have coming will be out tomorrow. Then that I'm doing an editorial on everything that's happening with Disney right now, and uh, with the whole "Don't Say Gay" bill and the takeover by activists, and what may happen with that. Uh, so yeah, go check that out. So yeah, thanks. Midnight's Edge. Nice. Um, the link to the Midnight's Edge is in the description, so please give them a subscribe. Yeah. 
Uh, I can go next. Uh, my channel is Ricada Law on YouTube. I do a YouTube stream pretty much every night for about three hours, uh, starting at 11 p.m. Central Time. And uh, we talk about uh, all a bevy of subjects. Sometimes they're legally related. Sometimes they're entertainment related. And a lot of times uh, it's just me making fun of somebody and drinking a lot of whiskey. So if you like that, come hang out. And uh, I don't know what we're talking about tonight. Frankly, I'll, I'll figure it out soon. We've been talking about the Supreme Court nominee in the United States and her confirmation hearings and her troubling stances on uh, letting child predators uh, with out with really light sentences. So that's been fun. Ooh, lovely. Mm. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, here's a question for you, Mahler. What is the EFAP? Oh, that's almost a secret. I'm not even sure. A lot of people guessed it in our chat when we were talking about it, but I have been spending the past few days editing up this fucking supercut, and it's going to be a thing that me, Rags Free, and uh, some, guests, some guests are going to be responding to. We talked about doing it for a while, so some of you may know what it is, but it's still kind of a surprise. It may even have to be over two EFAPs. It's a big thing, but uh, it's just an event that happened about a month ago that was big in terms of our spheres, uh, specifically EFAP, and one of the guests we have on quite a bit. And we're finally going to be checking out all the arguments that got made. Because I've been busy, right? We had Batman, Boba Fett, a bunch of bullshit to do. So <laughs> now we're all ready to check out whatever this may be. So uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's a little bit of a mystery. Tune in and to find out, which will be, yeah, Saturday. Nice. All right. Great stuff. Um, well, I'll probably do a catch up stream for this on Sunday night. That's when I tend to do them. So um, catch me then. Uh, but I yeah, thanks to all you, you. If you wish, thank you very much. Mm. Um, yeah, thanks to all you guys for tuning in tonight. Hope you've you've enjoyed our little stream, and um, yeah, we'll catch you on Sunday if you're you want to do the the catch up stream. Um, and thank you to my my mods for doing a great job as they always do. Very much appreciated for all you guys. Uh, but yeah, for now at least that's all we.